You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. I had a troubled youth, struggled in school. Uh, I was a victim of sexual abuse when I was eight, nine years old. Uh, and then me and mum, mum had me at 15. Uh, sorry, she got pregnant at 15, had me at 16. We had a very, you know, it was a poor environment to be around, struggled in school. So my network that I was providing steroids to quickly escalates to exporting methadrone, it's exporting ecstasy, importing cannabis, exporting cannabis. And the police had had this allegation that I threatened somebody with a firearm and they come to the house and they raided the house looking looking for a firearm and they, they, they tore the place to pieces. This is where karma really kicked in. The guy who I'd had assaulted and robbed, as soon as he went in for his first interview, he gave them everything they could possibly want and more. For whatever reason, I had more money than sense at the time. I was probably making about about 20 grand a week profit at the time, but for whatever reason, being a tight ass, I didn't want to throw these sex toys away. So what can I do with these? So we took this stance, I put this video up, said we're not closing, and then within 24 hours, I think that video had like four or five million views. So we had the police there the next day. Oh, we believe you don't intend to close tomorrow. We just need to let you know that we are going to come and find you if you don't, blah, blah, blah. And then for a year and a half, we've locked everybody down permanently, fed them fast food and said, you're not allowed out to exercise. So all we've done is cripple the NHS further. I mean, don't get me wrong, I was guilty of the crime. I facilitated it, I put them two people together. And I, as you can imagine, I regret it more than anything. But the money laundering comments is what really, really got me. Boom, we're on. And today's guest, we've got Nick Capo. Good to see you, Nick. Good to see you, brother. Long overdue. Yeah, it's coming for a while, but you're just out of prison. Over in Jersey, you got a three-year sentence. You made world headlines with not closing your gym. You were very anti-authority. Not anti-authority, but anti-lockdown. You stood up for yourself. You believed in what was right. You made headlines all over the world. People supporting you, people against you. You end up going to prison for something that happened years ago. Was it through text messages? Yeah, text messages, six signal messages it was, yeah. First of all, where are you? Good to be home. Yeah. Again, yeah. Did not see that one coming at all. Uh, as you know, off the back of the, the COVID situation and everything else, I was in a really good place. And to have something from three, four years ago come back up to bite me at the, probably the best point in my entire life was, a, a, you know, it's been a, it's been a tough journey, but I'm glad to be home and it's uh, it's another chapter for the story, isn't it? Yeah, well, I'm glad to have you home. Glad to get you out. You were coming on the podcast before it all went down, but before we get into everything, I always go back to the start of my guests to get a bit of understanding about you, where you grew up and how it all began. I grew up on a little council estate in Merseyside. Um, I had a troubled youth, struggled in school. Uh, I was a victim of sexual abuse when I was eight, nine years old. Uh, and then me and mum, mum had me at 15, uh, sorry, she got pregnant at 15, had me at 16. We had a very, you know, it was a poor environment to be around, struggled in school. And we moved away from that area when I was about 10 years old, uh, moved into a different area. So the sexual abuse stopped. And then I go into high school. Um, again, struggled in school, didn't really fit in, didn't like the conventional schooling system whatsoever. It just didn't, it didn't fit me. Um, <clears throat> They tried to diagnose me with ADHD when I was in school, but my my mum refused to have the assessment done. Her exact words to the to my head teacher at the time was, "Look, my son isn't disabled. You're not. You're not. You know. You're not examining him whatsoever." So I went misdiagnosed for the best part of twenty years. So I struggled through school, and I eventually dropped out when I was about twelve. About twelve years old, I dropped out of school, uh, and then I. I got into parkour and free running. Basically the way that started is we were just like most kids on council estates. We just used to go out looking for getting chased by the police. You know, we go and cause some trouble, get chased by the police. But then we got, we got really, really good at getting away. Uh, and then we found some videos on the internet of something called parkour or free running, which originated in France. And there was a team over there and they were, 
super skilled in efficiency and the art of movement, getting from A to B, running across rooftops really fast. It were very much like a, a urban assault course, you know, type type environments. So we got really, really talented at that. So I dropped out of school at this point and I was just doing this every day with my friends. They were a bit older than I was. And being one of the first teams in the country doing it, we ended up getting picked up for adverts and music videos very early on. So you're talking, skip forward a few years, 15, 16, coming on to 17, we're getting picked up by Adidas, Red Bull, you know, MTV. We, 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 we are being flown around the world business classes as teenagers who've just dropped out of school. And it was the experience that we had through that chapter of my life going from what was a a very very tough and very underprivileged upbringing into okay all of a sudden we're traveling business class we're flying all around the world we're working with some of the biggest brands in the world and that was a that was a super positive time in my life we got you know we, we got to travel everywhere we got to meet people from all over the world all different race, races religions you know it was it was eye-opening and it put me in a it put me in a really good place, a really fortunate place, both financially and in terms of, you know, the the, the wealth of experience and having been everywhere. Um, so that was a really positive turning point for me. And then I get to get to about nineteen, and I start suffering with injuries, and I had to come away from the sport. And that's when that's when things started to turn for the worst. Uh, I dropped out of I dropped out of that industry and I said I'm going to take a year off. Doctor said to me, "You you can either take a year off and let your knees recover, or you can carry on, and you'll inevitably need surgery, and then you're going to be out for good." So I took the year off, and in that year that I had off, I thought, "Okay, I'll join the local gym, local fitness center. I'll stay fit whilst I'm taking some time out. You know, keep myself able, keep my mind healthy, my body healthy." So I joined the local gym. And I was in good shape at the time, obviously through gymnastics and everything else that we've been doing. You know, I, I, I carried a good frame, so I had a really good base to start on. And within within six months of joining the gym, I'd met you know the the, the gym crowd, and I'm mingling with the gym crowd, and all of a sudden I get introduced to bodybuilding, and with bodybuilding comes steroids. So now I'm. 19 and a half approaching 20 i've started taking steroids i've fallen in with the with this whole new crowd and come away from what was a very positive holistic approach to life with my free runner friends into this culture of vanity and ego and everybody trying to be better than each other and it, it's you know at 19 20 years of age when you're sending your hormones through the roof because you're injecting yourself with all sorts that lifestyle took a grip of me to you know, to a, to a huge extent. And I really started to lose my personality. And shortly off the back of that, I competed in bodybuilding for the first time. This was as a junior. So I'm about 20, about 20 years of age at this time. And I competed in the junior British Open and I, I, I won that competition. So I won the junior, junior Mr. Brit Britain title in 2012. And then from the back of that, <laughs> the exposure that I had from that in that industry, because we're talking, we're talking pre Instagram era now. I mean, obviously fitness now, as you know, is, is huge. Absolutely. It's everywhere you look, it's there. You know, the, the, the Instagram boom of say 2014, 15, everybody does fitness or everybody knows somebody that does fitness. We're talking 2012 here. So it's before that. And I've just won the British title. So I'm featuring in magazines. I'm getting a lot of attention because it was such a niche industry and I was so young. I was getting a lot of attention then and I'd already fallen victim to this culture of, you know, the ego and the vanity and the power and being better than other people. So all this just feeds into this, this, this egomaniac, this, this monster of, you know, wanting, you know, wanting praise left, right and center, wanting to have power over people. And then I suppose, I suppose the big jump was when I've gone from taking steroids to now I've got this big network and I, I, by chance stumbled across, uh, across a, a manufacturer of steroids and we got quite close. So I've gone from taking steroids now and I thought, right, I'll sell enough steroids so that I can pay for my own course. Okay. That goes on a couple of weeks and then it's, well, maybe I can sell enough steroids to pay for my own course and pay for bills and so on and so on. And this escalates over the, over the space of, of, I don't know, four, five, six, seven months. And that quickly jumped to exporting steroids around the world with the contacts that I'd made from my free running age. 
So everybody that I've met all across Europe, all, all across America, I've reached out to these people looking for looking for customers essentially. So I start exporting steroids. And then amidst all that, I take a job on working club security in Liverpool. So I started working the doors. Now that at this point now I'm making enough money from selling steroids that I don't I don't need the money. I'd taken the job working on the doors purely because I wanted to be in that environment. You know, I wanted wanted to feel powerful, which I think is something a lot of a lot of men who take go into that trade fall victim to. You know, they they wanna they wanna have that power. So we start working on the doors now. I'm in Liverpool City Centre and I start mixing with, you know, more people who I've never never been around in my entire life. The type of people who, you know, you're reading about in books when you're younger or you hear legends on the estates. You know, you, you start mixing in these circles in the clubs and on the doors and you start meeting, you know, old generation gangsters and all of a sudden, you know, you have this huge network around you and you have access to anything you want wholesale be it drugs guns wh whatever it is so my network that i was providing steroids to quickly escalates to exporting methadrone it's exporting ecstasy importing cannabis exporting cannabis all you know completely tangled in this web of you know, people that I'd met, and this has only this has only been the space of twelve months. So I've gone from this kid at nineteen who was, you know, had a super positive circle, everything was, you know, good energy, good vibes, to skip forward a year. I'm taking steroids. I've lost my personality. I was ego obsessed. I've become extremely violent. My social circle had gone from, you know, as I say, really really positive influences to people who just thrive off violence they thrive off you know the, the the power the crime the drugs you know the weapons and the contrast between the person that i was at 19 to the person that i became at 20 you wouldn't even recognize that person whatsoever and things from there the, the, the three years that followed or the two and a half years that followed that were undoubtedly the you know the, the worst chapter of my life was I lost myself completely. And I got arrested for the first time in, I think it was January, 2013 for a firearms allegation. Um, and I, I still had, I had a sponsorship at the time with a company called Optimum Nutrition. And at the time they were the, the biggest, you know, supplement protein company in the world. And the police had had this allegation that I threatened somebody with a firearm and they come to the house and they raided the house looking looking for a firearm and they, they they tore the place to pieces tore my range over to pieces you know fingerprint dusts or dust over anything they could and i had a i had a spare room in the house at the time and it had like 100 tubs of protein in there that had been sent by optimum nutrition and the police had opened up every single every single tub and poured in solvent to see what it was um they found no firearms, they found a few bits of drugs, a bit of cash. And then I was bailed for that offence in 2013 and remained on bail for about another year until I was arrested again for my first Jersey offence. Now, what had happened in the meantime is as well as exporting, I had a, a strong network within Liverpool city centre because that's that's where I was living now. I was living uh, right in the middle of Liverpool city centre. I had a, a fifteen bedroom apartment right bang in the middle of the city centre whilst I was uh, whilst I was working on the doors. And we had a couple of particular clubs as our areas. That was kind of you know you that's us. You don't go there. And there was a a new kid on the block trying to make a name for himself he'd been in the clubs you know giving it the big talk a few years older than me at the time I'd, I'd have only been about 22 23. um and he he'd been trying to move in on our territory so to speak so we we broke a deal i asked a mate of mine he's a really soft looking guy i said look give me a favor i want you to text this guy and i want you to order a small amount of drugs off him Go and meet him, look as geeky as you possibly can, go and see him. So he goes, he meets this guy, he gets a small amount, comes back. I said, right, do me a favor, wait four or five days, and then I want you to meet him again. I want you, I want you to ask him for a bit more. 
okay, does it, meet him, right. I want you to wait a week now, maybe two weeks, message him, say, look, you and your, you and your, you and your roommates in college and university, sorry, you're about to get your student grants and you want to buy a big amount of drugs. And may, you know, come across as naive as you possibly can, you know, to tell him whatever price that he says, you know, make out like you're really happy with that, you know, make him feel like he's got the deal of a century. So we set this deal up and we meet this guy I sent my mate as the driver and one of our Albanian mates who I'd met through the through the doors uh, in the back seat, and they pick him up. Anyway, he took him down a back alley in Liverpool and beat the life out of him, took everything off him, kicked him out the car and nothing but his boxer shorts, took the drugs off him, his clothes, his phone, everything. And a couple of days later, I've got in touch with him and said, listen, you want to work in that area in Liverpool? You work for us or you don't work at all. And anyway, he, he so with me and him got talking and it turned out that he had some friends in Jersey and he thought Jersey might be a good market. He's like, look, I, I can go and work for you in Jersey. I can set up over there. So we goes for it. We sent him over to Jersey to set up shop and he'd been there all of about two weeks and we'd sent him a couple of parcels over and we were due to have some money sent back in the post. And I just split up with my girlfriend at the time and I said to one of, my, one of my mates, Carl, I said, look, should we go over to Jersey and just pick this money up? We don't need to, but let's make a weekend of it. Let's go over to Jersey, pick this money up, kill a bit of time. I'll have a laugh. Don't, not nothing. And then we flies to Jersey on the Friday, me and my pal Carl, and unbeknownst to us, the police had us under surveillance from the minute we stepped off the plane. So f further into this, we see pictures of us quite literally stepping off the plane. So they already knew we were coming. Um, so we get into Jersey town centre and we sat down, me, my pal Carl and the other fella on the end and we, we sat in this pub about to order food and I got the menu and this woman comes and stands next to me and she, she I thought she's clearly a waitress. So I start reading my order off and she just looks at me funny and I'm you know, a little bit suspicious at this point. And within about 30 seconds, the, the, the pub was full with police. We had about 30 police officers in the pub. So the arresters, they take us to the to Jersey's custody suite and they they quiz us and they'd found a, a quantity of methadrone in this guy's house where he where he just set up shop in Jersey. Um now they kept us the idea was they kept keep us ex excommunicado for three days. So they didn't want us to contact the outside world, but the officer on the desk wasn't made aware of this until after they gave me a phone call. So I managed to get a phone call back home. I said, look, I've been arrested just to let you know. I'll keep you updated. That's that. So I managed to get that phone call home. Now, they interviewed this guy, and this is where karma really kicked in. The guy who I'd had assaulted and robbed. As soon as he went in for his first interview, he gave them everything they could possibly want and more. So he, they had the quantity of methadone they found him with, but they also, he also made a point of telling them, oh, there's, there's another package that's come over that contain cannabis, ecstasy tablets. He went above and beyond and gave them a lot more information than they already had. And then he also, he, he dramatized it to the point where he's telling these police officers that the guy I had with me was my bodyguard because my pal Carl is like six foot three. He's about 120 odd kilos. He's a huge guy, but he's a gentle giant. But to look at, he's fucking terrifying. So he's he's giving them this story, trying to paint this picture of me being this this big gangster in Liverpool. And as much as I'd like to have thought that at the time, I was just a kid trying to play big gangster. And obviously, I I very quickly become aware of how not gangster I was with some of the people that I met, which which I'll go into. But we're at this point now. We're in the we're in the Jersey custody suite, and they. They contacted Merseyside Police and said, "Look, we want you to raid his premises." you know, back in uh, back in Merseyside. So they got this warrant, it took them two days. And the address that I gave them wasn't my house address. I gave them my grandmother's address at the time. And they didn't question it, they took the address. It took them two days to get this, this search warrant. And I think they had about 20 officers turn up at my grandmother's house, 12 o'clock on a Saturday or a Sunday afternoon. And this is, this is a, you know, a, a big street on a council estate and you can, neighbors can see up and down the road as you know there's a, there's a there's a big front yard so you've got 20 police officers there now and they search the house and they don't find anything besides this one safe so it's a it's a fairly chunky safe 
And my nan said they, they thought they'd really hit the jackpot. They got this huge safe. They brought it out onto the front yard to to smash it in with a, a red key, you know, the, the big buttons he hit the, the front doors in with. So they've got this safe on the front on the front yard now. And they'd made a big spectacle of it as if, you know, they were about to hit the jackpot. This is going to be full of firearms, drugs, whatever it was, because it was, it was a pretty big safe. Now, as I said, I just split up with my girlfriend at the time and I just started seeing somebody else. And this is where I was living. I'd now had this new girlfriend come around and with the previous one I was with, we'd spent about two and a half grand on sex toys. So we had all kinds of funky shit. And we just split up. I was seeing this new girl and for whatever reason, I had more money than sense at the time. I was probably making about about 20 grand a week profit at the time. But for whatever reason, being a tight ass, I didn't want to throw these sex toys away. So we've got, what can I do with these? I know I've got a spare safe. I'll put them in the safe. I'll put the safe in my grand's house. And then that's fine. She won't be able to get into it. She won't know what's there. I can just put that there out the way and then it is what it is. So skip forward now. You've got 20 Merseyside police officers outside my grand's house with this big safe and the big red key. And they are plowing the front of this safe in with this, this giant red key, making loads of noise. And you've got all the neighbors out watching everything else. And they finally get the door off it. And all they manage to pull out of it is a shit ton of sex, dirty sex toys. <laughs> so we, we, so that's how that went. So that I, I, and to this, up until the day my nan died, she never mentioned what they found in there. Ever. <laughs> it's never ever discussed. It was just, yeah, they had the safe, they had it outside and that was it. She's never never mentioned to the day she died what it is that they found. Didn't say nothing to me whatsoever. So they were they were forced to bail us then. They found nothing. Um, so they, they bail us and they let us out to the police station at like midnight on the on the Sunday night. We've been there like three days at this point. <clears throat> and they remanded the they remanded the other kid that was working for us. Because he, he, you know, he gave himself up and he gave us up at the same time. So they, they remanded him and he bailed us and he let us out. It must have been near midnight. He took all our money off us and just pointed and said, the airport's so many miles that way. See you later. So we flies back home and they bail me. I think it was about six weeks bail or eight weeks bail. What year? So this was, this was 2014. So this would have been... So I won my, I won the junior British bodybuilding competition in 2012, 2013, I was arrested for the first time on the firearms allegation. And then while still on bail for that, this is late spring, early summer, 2014, they've arrested me for this and they've, they've bailed us. We come back home. So come back in six weeks. So six weeks goes by and I'm still on bail for this other charge. So I email the, I email Jersey police and say, look, I want to get this this UK charge out the way first. Would you mind waiting before I come back for this second interview? So they give me a bit of time, bit of time goes, bit of time goes. And then I got bailed again on the UK charge. And then they said, look, we really need to come back and do this second interview now. So I speak to my solicitor and I said, look, do me a favor. Let, tell them, tell them I can't afford to fly over. So he tells Jersey police this and the, the officer he speaks to just laughs at him down the phone. He just laughed at my grief. He's like, right, okay, I'll get back to you. Two days later, he rings back. He's like, okay, the attorney general signed it off. We're going to pay for his flight to come over. No more excuses. So I said to me, I said, look, we're out of options now. Just tell them I'm not going. They'll have to come and get me if they want me. So he sends that and we didn't hear nothing for about four weeks. And then for some reason, we took it four or five weeks on, they ring him and they contact him again and say, right, we've obtained the European arrest warrant. We're coming for him. Why, what, to this day, I don't understand why they give him the heads up, but they said, look, we're coming for him just to let you know, you know, we're at some point we're going to come and get him. So I get the call from my solicitor and I, I still remember the day I was sat at the, sat at the beach with one of my mates, Craig, and I get the call from Sam and my solicitor and he's like, look, Nick, they're coming. I said, what do you mean? He said, we've got the European arrest warrant coming for you. you I, I can't I can't advise you on what best to do here, but I just got to let you know they're coming. So <clears throat> I put everything in storage. I put my car in storage, put all my clothes in storage, my money, my jewelry. And I start living in hotels for six, seven weeks. And it was a miserable time. I mean... It, being on the land, being on the run, it sounds like this, this, you know, romanticized idea of, you know, it's all fun and exciting, but 
when you when you're in a hotel and they only have three different meals on the menu and you're watching broadcast TV, like it is the most depressing experience I've ever I've ever done. So I've done that for six seven weeks. No sign of the police. No doors have gone in. Nothing. They must have been bluffing, trying to get me to go over there. So I thought, okay, I'm I'm good. So this is seven weeks on, six seven weeks on now, and we're in the September of 2014. <clears throat> so I thought, okay, I'm going to come back out. And I says to my, I'd given up my my apartment block in town at the time. And I says to my mum, look, I'm going to come and stay with you for two or three weeks whilst I find somewhere new. Do me a favour, don't answer the door to anybody. Whatever you do, don't care who you think it is, don't answer the door. And I still, in the background, I still had everything everything going on. We were still importing, we were still exporting, and I was making more money than I knew what to do with at the time. And I, you know, we were quite literally doing about twenty grand a week profits for me personally, and that's. For a kid that's grew up on a council estate and I'm making my, my mum's yearly salary in a week, I had more money than I knew what to do with. And it was it was past the point of the money meaning anything because everything had become a little bit tasteless. You know, when you can buy anything, nothing nothing gives you that that stimulus anymore. You can buy whatever car you want, you can go out and you can eat you can eat in restaurants three three times a day and take everybody with you and you can buy the bar out when you go out clubbing and you, you, you need more and more stimulus you know, the, the more that you get. So I'd become numb to everything at the time, but we were still cracking on, still doing what we were doing. So I comes back, I comes out of hiding, comes to my mum's, pulled my car back out of storage. And I, have a, I had a private plate on it at the time. I did very atypical wannabe gangster Range Rover, fully blacked out. You know, looking back, I cringe on a lot of it now. Do you know what I mean? I, I fitted the stereotype down to a T. I must have been 115 kilo skinhead, black on black Range Rover, unemployed. It, it, everything that you could possibly do wrong, I was doing wrong. I, I Red flags top to bottom. So I pulled my car out of storage and I've been back out a few days and then we, we went... I was going out for a night, a night out with the lads who I worked off the doors with. So I was coming through Liverpool tunnel, which separates uh, Wirral from Liverpool. So I was coming through this tunnel with one of my pals in the car. This must have been about 10 o'clock at night on a Friday or a Saturday. And we've come through, we've come through the tunnel. And just as we come out Liverpool side, I see a police car sweep behind me. And I said, said, I said to the lad in the passing seat, I was like, I'm getting pulled over here. I said, I think this is it. I said, I think they're coming for me. He said, look, I said, whatever happens, just don't, don't make any drama out of it. And I said, it is what it is. And he pulled me over. That's exactly what happened. We had one car, one car pulled behind us and another car pulled in front and then one on the side. So he boxes in completely on this bend coming out of Liverpool tunnel. And they come over to the window and she's asking me all the normal questions. You know, what's your name, date of birth, whose is the car? It's like, uh, it's my mum's car. What does your mum do? She's a care worker. She's obviously just looking at me like, and this is your mum's car, is it? Yeah, yeah. What do you do? I said, I'm un unemployed. Again, red flag, red flag, red flag. And then she says, can you just wait there for a minute? She goes and stands in front of the in front of the car and she must have been there for five or 10 minutes on the radio. And I'm just waiting for her to come and get me out of the car and arrest me. And she comes back to the car and I said, look, do you mind me asking why you pulled me over? And she said, oh, we've just been asked to, to verify the, the vehicle information, whatever else is like, uh, oh God, you, you're free to go. You can, you can go on your way. And at that point, I didn't understand what it was that had actually, what had just happened, but Jersey police had been on my Facebook and being, again, your atypical 21, 22 year old wannabe gangster. I got a picture of my car on Facebook with the registration plate on it and everything else. Jersey police contacted the Merseyside police and said, look, AMPR this car, pull it over and make sure the driver is in fact Nick. So that when we fly over with this European arrest warrant, all we need to do is AMPR him and we can get him there and then. And five, six days later, I get woken up at 10 o'clock in the morning by loads of screaming downstairs, mum against what I'd said, I'd opened the door to the police thinking it was the postman. And I had 20 police, 20 Merseyside police and three of Jersey police who'd flown over, come in and ar arrested me. And they come, they come up the stairs and I just said, look, I, I, no hassle from me, no drama. Look, just let me get dressed. Let me, let me, let me girlfriend know what's going on. I'll come with you, no, no fuss. And he flies over and they were decent with me. Like Jersey police says, I mean, Jersey's only nine by five miles. It, it's super chill, one horse town. The police were really decent with me. And they, they, they flew me over and the guy that arrested me is, you tell he really loved his job. She was the, Jim McGranahan, I think his name is, and he's the guy that caught 
Curtis Warren to be bragging to me on the plane about, you know, I'm, I got Curtis, I got Curtis. I don't, I don't know why he thought that was going to impress me. Do you know what I mean? I'm like, I'm not in the kind of place here for you to be telling me these stories. Do you know what I mean? So we get there anyway. And I finally get a copy of the interview from the, the you know, the guy that rolled on us and some of the information he'd given there was, was you know, he blew everything out of proportion. And he, he really did make me seem to be the next big thing. And that's what Jersey thought I was. Now, I'd never dealt in... I'd never dealt in big weight. I'd only ever dealt in small weight at high value. So what I was doing was aiming for the, the, the smaller populations, aiming for the islands to maximize the money I was getting. And we were, we were bringing boxes of weed over from Spain. And I mean like piss poor quality that you couldn't sell anywhere. It was bush. I think we were paying about 2000 euro a kilo. And we were sending that over to the likes of Jersey and the Isle of Man and places like that. And because they'd never had, never really had bud before, they'd only had like pollen and rocky, the old school type stuff with people sending it over in cars. It was getting snapped up. So we were making ridiculous amounts of money by, you know, uh, only dealing in very small quantities. So we had loads of money, but we weren't dealing in, in, in big volume. And as I say, the, the circles that we then got into, because people see that you're doing well, especially in, in that industry, and they want a piece of it. So I, I had a lot of people then latch onto me around this time and all, all the all the original friends that I grew up with had slowly started to drop away. And now I'm surrounded by gangsters and doormen and, and fighters, boxers. And, you know, it was it was completely different. And then you know, naturally you then become surrounded by false friends, people who were there for the money and the lifestyle and everything else. But you get lost in that quite easily, especially when you're, you know, 21, 22 years of age and you've got, you know, dozens of people around you, you know, putting on this facade of, you know, really caring for you and all they really care about is the lifestyle. And it wasn't until I got into my sentence that that really hit me. And I got, so it was October 2014 when they arrested me and they remanded me immediately. And I didn't get sentenced until the February of 2015. Get sentenced February 2015 and got six years for importation of ecstasy, cannabis and methadone into Jersey. Um, and that took me, it took me nearly a year to get back to the UK because if I had stayed in Jersey, I'd have done two thirds of my sentence. There's no cat D, there's no open prison, there's, there's no progression. I'd have done four years behind the door. And, you know, as as far as prisons go, Jersey prison is is the Titanic of the prison system. You are, you talk, you, we're talking 2014 here and you'd go into your cell and you had a, a thing, fingerprint scanner above a, a plasma TV and it would log you into your account and you've got Sky Sports, you've got National Geographic, like, it's like being in a holiday camp, but to do an extra, extra couple of years behind the door, I had to get out and I transferred eventually in the October of 2000 and tell a lie, the August of 2015, I managed to transfer home. And at this point now I'd been in, I don't know, about eight months and I'd lost, I'd started to lose contact with the people that I'd picked up along the journey of, of, of getting into crime and violence and they'd start to drop off. And I, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a story that always sticks with me or one, one that I always like to share about what happened there. And I had, you, you have a, you had a picture board in your cell in Jersey and it's about a meter by a meter. And when I first come in, the photos that I requested to get sent in and I, I filled this board up and it's pictures of luxury cars and nights out and champagne bottles and jewelry and all this. So my wall was full of all this materialistic, you know, power driven, ego driven, driven image with all these people around me who'd only been in my life for about 12 months. And then slowly over that journey of whilst I was still in Jersey prison over that eight months, maybe week by week, the letters had stopped coming in from them people and people from my previous life had start popping up and they'd send some pictures in and very, very slowly and progressively over that eight months, then pictures started to come down and the pictures started to go up with a life beforehand. And that, that was the, I didn't notice what was happening at the time of, you know, of, of slowly adjusting the board. It just, you know, it just, I didn't think any more of it than one picture down, one picture up. And then I think I've been in about six months and I look up the board and for whatever reason, it, you know, it, it hit me then that, the board that I put up when I come in versus what I had in front of me now 
were completely different. None of the faces were the same. I'd gone, I'd gone back to the people who were still in touch and the people who were still sending me pictures of the people that I had around me prior to getting into that world. And that was, that was kind of the, the turning point for me of, wow, I really, really lost myself and I lost so many good people around me. And even, even to this day, there's people that I lost around that time that I still haven't managed to get back in my life despite the, the journey that I've been on. That's the difficult thing though when you do bad, you lose the good as well because we always want more. And when you want more or try and search for better, it's never there anyway. See, when you were like eight and you were going through that, your sexual abuse, like, did you deal with that at a young age? Did you tell anyone? Or was that later in life? No, so that, with the sexual abuse, so I'd have been, and I can't remember the exact age, but it'd been somewhere around eight or nine. I think it went on for about a year. And this, the, the lad lived down the street from us. He'd have been about twice my age. We'd have been about 16, 17. This went on for about 12 months. And then once we moved, and I, I buried that, not consciously, I must have subconsciously just compartmentalized it, put it to the back of my mind. And I did, didn't deal with that again until 2016, 17, when I seen a psychiatrist for the first time in prison. And we had a conversation and obviously she delved deep and wanted to know more and more and more. And for whatever reason, for the first time in 15 years, I talked about it. And that was, you know, I, I don't know if that was, you know, self-preservation that I put that to the back of my mind or whether I just moved on from it really quickly. But that was the first time that I'd really, really tried to process it was sat down with the psychiatrist because I'd, I'd never had therapy before. I'd never had counseling before. And I didn't realize how empowering it can be talking to somebody who's completely objective, you know, somebody who's doesn't know the people that you know, you're not going to have a conversation with this person and they're going to go and tell their mate who tells their friend who tells six of your mates and all of a sudden everybody knows your business. You know, it's, it's, it's a completely private conversation and you can really let go. And that was, that was the first time I talked about a lot of trauma that I'd had growing up. And it was, it was really empowering. And that was like, the journey that I went on through that sentence. You know, I found myself again, but I was also able to process a lot of stuff from being a kid because you had the sexual abuse. As I said, we grew up in poverty and my mum was only 15 years older than me. So, it, you know, her, her, her parenting skills were poor and I, I don't hold that against her. That, that's more of a, I wouldn't have done any better at 15 and I, I couldn't judge her for that. And I, I would not judge her for that. But, you know, she, I, I went through a lot of neglect and we had no money, we had no food and you know, oftentimes where me and my best friend Kyle, he was in a very similar situation. We'd go out and we'd go, we'd climb over the back of the fences at Tesco and we'd dig through the bins and we'd get all the damaged tin food. And that's kind of how we got by for most of our early teenage years. And, you know, I tell that story to people and they're like, oh, you know, I feel so terrible for you. And I'm like, listen, we, we went through a really, you know, we were in a really harsh environment, but we were happy kids. We had nothing, but we were happy. And that that's, it's difficult for a lot of people to get to, you know, to understand unless you've been through a hardship like that yourself, that, you know, it, it it's, you can make the most out of nothing and hardship is, you know, it's character building. And if you don't go through any hardship, chances are you're not going to have much, much about your personality. No. Childhood trauma is it's the worst as well, especially going through sexual abuse. A lot of people who have had on have ended up doing life in prison. They've ended up suicidal, addicted to drugs, drink, like... How much did parkour then save your life? Like from the kid who's raiding bins to survive, not really got any love around them, being sexually abused to then being fit, strong, and like you say, nature, naturally people strong, living outside and having fun and, and living, like all the materialistic shit. We can wear the nice watches, drive the nice cars and chase the false dreams, but it doesn't really, it has, doesn't really mean fuck all. And it's easy to say once you've had it, but when you've not had it and you get it, you realise once you get it, there isn't everything and it takes... It's weird because it actually takes you to get something that you've chased your whole life to realise it was a fu fucking wasted year chasing that shit. Do you know what I mean? Like, how much did it then, because you never went down, I always, I'm, I'll say, like, hurt people, hurt people, no matter if it was your yeah. fault or not. If you're abused you mentally, physically or emotionally, like, if you're tormented inside, like, if you're hurt, you will hurt other people. And going on in life and trying to find therapy and trying to do the right things, when you heal, then you can help, like... We all fuck up, we all make mistakes and you'll be living with trauma and pain for the rest of your life and that's why these podcasts are so good it's to understand the person, why they get involved in what they're involved in. Like, we all fuck up, we all make mistakes but for you to get in through that to basically eating from the streets, how much did the parkour stuff save your life? 
I think had I not found parkour at the age that I did, I, I very much suspect I'd have been dead at the age of 18. And now, so sexual abuse stopped at age 10 when we moved out the area. I started secondary school and I was a troubled kid. I was fighting every day. I was extremely violent. And <clears throat> I got to say 12 and I got arrested for assault. I, I kicked somebody in the face and they'd lost, they'd lost their front teeth. So I got charged with GBH and this is a, this is a 12 years old now. So school separated me. One of the witnesses was in my class, in my form in school, and they put me segregated in a, in a porter cabin at the side of the school and caged windows on it. It was about as dramatic as it gets for school. So they, they isolated me from everybody in school. And that just, you know, that just exacerbated the hatred that I already had for the, you know, for the conventional system. So I, I stopped going in the end and police, uh, sorry, and the, the, the school, kind of gave me a lot of leeway with that. It's not like it is now. If you take two days off, you know, they're onto your parents for truancy and whatever else. But it was a bit more relaxed then and my my mum couldn't have cared less anyway. You know, I was I was a she let me do whatever I wanted, which was a blessing and a curse at the same time. I had all the freedom to do whatever I want, but also I didn't have any of that nurturing and any any of the loving instinct that you get from, you know, from from you know your natural mother. And Coming into 12, 13 now, so I've dropped out of school and I find parkour and for the first time in my life, I was part of a community. I had a sense of family, family. for the first time in my entire life. And I, I think I, I was spiraling, spiraling out of control up until that point. And the, the, the group that I got in with, one of the more talented guys, uh, I called Daniel Lilabaka. He was one of the one of the alphas of the of the parkour group at the time, and he, he comes from a, a very religious family. Now, I'm I'm not religious at all, but the morals that he brought into our community were, you know, you, you couldn't fault them. He was a good person. He was all about pe treating people de decent, and I took a lot of lessons from him, and I was willing to do that because he was such a talented athlete. And we're talking about somebody who's gone on to be in some of the biggest movies that have ever been released. He's a super talented guy. So because he was so talented at what we did, I was happy to take lessons from him and I was happy to learn from him. Whereas if you were a, a teacher or a relative or a police officer and you told me I need to do X, Y, and Z, I'd have told you to get lost. I wouldn't have taken you seriously because I idolized this guy and I took his message on board. And I got to, got to like 14, 15 and I was... I was just getting into everything, but I still felt quite depressed. And I, I always remember he took me, I told him how I was feeling. He's a few years older than me. He'd have been about 18, 19 at the time. And he's very mature for his age. And he took me to the top of this, you know, the, the, this high point in our area, this this apex. And we'd have been a, a hundred feet up and we just sat with our legs dangling over the edge, straight drop to the floor. And we're, we're talking deep. And he said, Nick, I want, I want you to, I want you to try something. I want to suggest something. And I don't want you to ask me why. I just want you to do it. He said, I want you to make a point of being kind and decent to everybody, even if they're not that way with you. And he's seen, you know, he's seen that I look puzzled. He's seen it in my face. And I, he said, don't, don't ask me why. He said, don't, 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 you know, don't dig too deeply into it. He said, just do this for me. Just go out of your way to be kind and decent to people and see, see what difference it makes. And I kind of shrugged it off and I thought, you know what, what have I got to lose? And from there onwards, I, I adopted that philosophy and I started being decent with people. And instead of trying to take the piss out of people all the time, mocking people, I really started supporting the people around me. And, and then everybody then starts being kinder to me. And then all of a sudden I'm being offered opportunities to, you know, this is where it comes in with the big brands, with, with Adidas and Red Bull and everything else that we were doing. Everybody was then decent to me and wanted me on board. And that's just from that small change in my personality of going from a kid who's been through trauma to lashing out to everybody to go and wait, hang on a minute. If I project myself in a different way, people are then going to receive me better and people want to give you more opportunities. If you're decent to people and people know you're a good guy, you find more success. And that, that's obviously not why you should do it, but as a secondary effect of being decent with people and being kind with people and being a genuine person, opportunities come to you. Yeah. And I, you know, I, and for the, for the five years that followed coming from a kid that's been scrounging out of bins to flying business class, you know, within the space of, of 12 months that put me in such an incredible, incredible place. And then when I got injured and making that decision to go into bodybuilding and competitive bodybuilding, I think that took me way back to where I was 10 years previous. And I had to go through that whole cycle again of 
losing my personality, lashing out, thriving off the violence, you know, because I, I had a, a lot of issues inside that I obviously hadn't processed. And without having all the positive influences around me, that starts to creep up and bubble up back to the top again. And, you, you know, that starts to start to take a grip of you. And, you know, uh, as, as you say, that's why it's important to have conversations like these, even if it's in a, a professional context with a, with a counselor or even talking to your friends or on a podcast, whatever it is, vocalizing it is such a, is such a strong way to start processing things. It can release the pain. It really can. And if I hadn't, you know, if you, if you don't find an outlet to, to channel that energy or at least to process, you know, you, you are statistically likely to go through a, you know, a really difficult life or end up in jail or end up passing on that sexual abuse to the next generation. And it, it, it's, you know, but I, but it is difficult about going through internal pain, blaming yourself, thinking it's you, it's done wrong. I believe that like, I've had rape victims on who blame themselves, that like, people who've been sexually abused as kids blame themselves. Like, it's to hold on to that poison and, and hatred and fear and guilt for people do it for 20, 30 years, people die with it. But like, to then be speaking to someone and, and releasing it, no doubt there have been emotional stuff like that. But see, when you started taking steroids, did that give you a, a false sense of, of power where it's like a shield where, yeah. because I always say this as well, that gangsters that come on, hold the guns, hold the knives, for me, they're fragile because it's not a humane thing to do is to hold a gun or a knife, but they do it because they're broken in my eyes because they don't want to feel pain anymore they don't want to be hurt so what i'll do is hold a gun or a knife try and stop you from hurting me but not realizing they're actually hurting others while hurting themselves so nobody wins but when you started feeling bigger feeling stronger did that give you a false sense of security as well where the violence kicks in and yeah it, it's it's all a facade then isn't it you are you know you're, you're projecting your insecurities and then you know, steroids in 2011, 2012, there was no, I mean, you, there's, there's banks of scientific literature now where you could, you could read it and you could, you know, you would know what you were doing. Back then it was, you go see Big Dave at the gym. Big Dave tells you to take X, Y, and Z and take as much of it as possible because he's the one selling it to you. You know, I'm 20 years of age and I'm filling myself with all kinds of hormones that aren't just, you know, designed for, for human consumption. I was taking something called Trembolone, which is designed for cattle. And that absolutely skewed my mind, and it, it it makes you feel it makes you feel superhuman, but it also makes you feel numb to a lot of a lot of the positive stuff. So the the the, the neurochemical impact that it has is it prohibits your brain's ability to produce, or or at least hinders it, dopamine and the like, and serotonin. So your ability to feel good is pretty much taken away, but you feel superhuman at the same time. You feel invincible, but you're miserable while you feel invincible. And that just feeds into everything that then come off the back of that feeling, you know, having this this strong facade in front of you of being 115 kilo and feeling like you look mean and wanting to be, you know, violent all the time and getting involved in guns for the first time. And all of that, as you say, is just a, a shield to protect what's really going on because you're dealing yeah. with these issues. Because you think, they say people get roid rage, but I think we just angry before and the roids just yeah. enhance it because of people I, mean, I smoked weed for 12 years so when I was I was a lazy bastard before I smoked weed <laughs> so when I smoked it I was even lazier and people can still go to the gym on it but for me if they never smoked it they have still went like do you feel roid, roid rage is a thing or is that a mental thing that we're already fucked in the head anyway I think scientifically they say about it can increase aggression in about 5% of the population but if you're a dick beforehand you're just going to be a bigger dick and and that that's that's the best way to see if you have them tendencies inside you anyway they're just going to be amplified tenfold if you're an if you're an angry kid or you're an insecure kid and all of a sudden you've now got 10 times the amount of testosterone in your system than you're meant to have i mean you you've seen what you've seen what kids are like you've seen what lads are like when they go through puberty and they lash out and that that's obviously with a with a relatively low amount of testosterone that, that's been introduced into the system you start putting in synthetically 10 times what you're meant to have as a grown adult, you are all over the place. And you are, if you are a little bit, you know, if you are inclined to be aggressive anyway, you're now gonna be 10 times bigger and more capable of doing more damage. And, and with, that, with that size and power comes more confidence to be that way. And one just feeds the other. And it's a very dangerous and very slippery slope to go down. And I did, 
I did a lot of damage to myself with my steroid use because at the time, and because I was competing, and a lot of people think, oh, well, you're competing, how could you, how could you take steroids? And they don't realize that the entire industry is untested. It's not like the Olympics. Every competitive bodybuilder you see, whether they admit it or not because of their sponsorships, is taking steroids to one extent or the other. And because there was no guidance at the time, and I think that's why it's important for people to talk about it, is I was just taking as much as I could of everything that I could. And I damaged my pituitary, pituitary gland. And I ended up seeing an endocrinologist for the three years I was in prison, trying to get myself back healthy again. And I'd done, I'd done damage to my brain. And he said, look, it's gonna take you three, four years to get back to a normal, a normal level if you ever do fully recover. And it, it, it's, you know, it was the, the unhealthiest that I'd ever been. And that's the risk that you run chasing image because big's never big enough. The same with the material side of things like the new fancy car. If that's not going to be enough, if you're not enough before you get it, you're never going to be enough when you get it because next year the new car comes out. If you get yourself the, the 600 pound pair of shoes, well, that brand brings out the next one and you're constantly chasing this, this, this stimulus and the sense of achievement and you just become numb to it and you chase it and chase it. And, you know, as you said earlier, like, you spend all your life chasing these goals. And if they're material goals, once you get them, the anticlimax of getting there is, you know, it, it, it's soul destroying. And then you're like, well, what do I do now? I just keep chasing. And then you spend your whole life in the rat race of just chasing this, yeah. you know, this, this, this one next level. And I think a lot, a lot of people fall victim to that, especially, especially those of us who've had hard upbringings. It's very easy to get lost in. I never had this when I was a kid. Now I do. This defines me and I've got to keep chasing this. And it, it, it it's, very, very dangerous. And that's why I think social media is very dangerous because people, the generation after me is now so consumed by how everything needs to look. And the um, highlight reels. Yeah, exactly. And it's, it's- We're the guinea pigs for it. Yeah. Even me, I'm addicted to my phone. I've got a great life, but why do I waste seven, eight hours a day? It used to be 12. I've came down a lot because I used to say I work so hard to provide for my kids and give them the things that I never want, that I never have. But that thing was just, spending time with them and loving them as much as I yeah. could. But that there is a gold. Like yeah. If you can nurture a kid and love a kid and protect a kid, your kid can be anything at once. You feed that kid materialistic shit, you feed them the new iPhone, the new PlayStation, new set of trainers, that kid's going to set yourself up for failure. You because can. that anti-climax that you talk about having that good thing, it ends up in the biggest depression. I remember when I got a Range Rover Sport, I, I remember driving down the motorway and I thought, I was sad. I was fucking sad. And I, I was thinking to myself, be grateful. And I was trying to um, speak five things to be grateful for to try and make myself happy. I got it and I was fucking sad. I remember fucking hell that. I used to have up my vision board, get this, and I got it. And then it was the watch and I got it and I was sad because I realised the journey is the most important thing to be happy. Listen, it's good to have good things and set yourself up 100%. for goals and yeah. achieve them. But trust me, when you get them, you realise that it ain't all that because we always chase that finishing line. And as soon as we get to the finishing line, there's always going to you be just, another one coming. There's always moving. more. At the height of your steroid abuse, what was your intake like on a daily basis and food? Steroid intake? Yeah. So I'd, I'd have been taking about... <laughs> Was insulin involved in that as well? Yeah, yeah. So I'd have been taking maybe a gram and a half of testosterone in a week. So it's about 1,500 milligrams. And then about half half a gram of Trembolone, about 500 milligrams. Every day I'd be taking about 200 milligram of oxymethylone, uh, which are naps, they're tablets. So I'd, I'd have been injecting about two grams of steroids a week and then orally taking about another gram and a half. And that is... Knowing what I know now, because because the the industry's adopted a kind of, or at least a, a niche section of the industry have adopted the right. We need to talk about this because if people are going to do it, they need to do it safely. You're, ne you're never going to stop people doing it at all. Like the, the the I think the last statistics that I seen was was crazy. This it's like an estimated I don't know if it's two and a half or three million steroid users in the UK. It's huge. So there is a need for people to talk about it, honestly, not to encourage it, but to say, look, this is what you shouldn't be doing. Don't read what Big Dave says on the internet because you're gonna do yourself serious harm. And what I was taking then versus what I know now and and you know the the the, the scientific literature that I've read over the last few years and understanding hormones better and, and endocrinology in general, that is 
fucking terrifying amounts of, of, yeah. of drugs. Do you think people need to be more educated then? Like, is there any benefits from doing steroids? There's benefits from doing testosterone, and you, medically you can't argue with that. It is a medical treatment. Testosterone replacement therapy is is a very common thing, and especially in the United States, you can go into your aging clinic and pay thirty dollars and get your script straight away. Like uh, you know, a, a low testosterone is is as much of an indicator of heart disease as high testosterone. So if you if you are on the lower end of the spectrum, say you're say you're stressed, you've got a heavy workload, you don't sleep a lot, you probably have low T, and if you've got low T your health risks increase dramatically. So you would then be somebody who's suitable for testosterone replacement therapy. And then you're talking about 150 milligrams a week is the medical dose, maybe a little bit lower. I was taking about 3000 a week. <laughs> yeah. So there are positives and it's a danger with the industry. And this, this is why it's, this is why it's really worrying. So I lost my sponsorship with Optimum Nutrition in 2013 because of my steroid use. I had I was quite vocal at the time about using steroids, not to encourage it by by any stretch of the imagination, but to be transparent. And Optimum Nutrition caught wind of this, and they called me down to London to this big conference room, and I met there with one of their one of their directors, and she said, "Oh, you know, we we, we just got some questions we want to ask you." And uh, I sit down with this woman, Je Jess, her name was. And I travelled down from London. We not long done Body Power, another show in Birmingham. Not long done Body Power for Optimum. And he goes and we sit in this boardroom. She's like, I've just got some questions. And she, she looks at me, she's like, uh, you know, we, we believe that you're taking steroids. And she's like, I just want to know if you know, if you've, if you've got anything to say to that, is it true? And I, and I looked at her and I thought, and I just asked her straight, I was like, do you want me to be honest with you here? Or do you want me to tell you what it is that you want to hear? And, and, she, and she looked at me and she's quite flirtatious and she's giggled. She's like, oh no, you know, be completely honest. I'd rather you just be honest with me. I said, I said, of course I am. I said, you go on your website right now and there's 30 athletes. I said, and I know about 20 of them personally, and every single one of them is taking steroids. Because she looked at me in, in absolute shock. I think she was expecting me to say no. And I said, yeah, I am. Of course I am. I'm a capacity bodybuilder. And I didn't name any of the lads, but I said, look, two thirds of, two -thirds of the sponsored athletes on the website, because there was about 30 of us, I said, they all take steroids. I said, you can't possibly be that naive. You can't think somebody can have a, 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 a grown man can have a waist like a 12 year old girl and, and shoulders that don't fit through the door naturally. Do you know what I mean? It just doesn't happen. And she, she, and this is a director of the biggest supplement company in the world at the time. And she was completely naive to the fact that the whole industry are taking anabolic steroids. And that's the problem that you come across because you have now all these top athletes in the industry that are taking steroids and they can't talk about it because part of their contracts with these big brands is you cannot take steroids. So, which is, which is ironic because I, I know of people in the industry who have big brand sponsors and the big brands are completely aware that they take it, but they have it in the contract to cover themselves. But then that, that disables their ability to talk about it, which is dangerous for two reasons. It's dangerous because okay, you're taking that, you should be honest about it. But more importantly, it's dangerous because you have all these people watching on these millions of followers who were looking at these physiques and thinking that's attainable. This person quite literally has natural bodybuilder in their, in their Instagram bio when they're not natural at all. So you get somebody that comes along, okay, I'm going to buy your three month training plan and I'm going to spend 400 pound on it. And I'm going to be like you. And they go three months in, six months in, nine months in, and they're natural and not much is happening. Am I the problem? Am I not working hard enough? What is it? And then you you know you end up giving people the, these complexes and these these body image issues of why can't I attain that if everything you're telling me is right? Why aren't I why aren't I worthy? Why can't I get there? And all we've done by hiding the topic is generated an entire generation of people who are being misled and are now you know we have more body image issues in this country than we've ever had in, in the, the history of statistics. Yeah, mankind. And kids kids are absolutely destroyed by it because you're looking at, not only have you got people who are taking all kinds of, you know, steroids and amphetamines to lose weight, the clenbuterol, subutramines, all of these compounds that they're using to look the way that they do. You then add on, add on top of that, filters, Photoshop, everything else. And you're just left, you're just left with 99.9% .9 of the population thinking, I'm not good enough. Why can't I look like that? And it's it's a 
it really is a trapeze wire for the brands because I understand why they won't allow people to talk about it. But at the same time, all you're doing is feeding into this this insecurity it's complex. Huge. Yeah. And what's it, the what's the negatives of steroid abuse? Of abuse. For kids is. who don't know, back in the day, like talking 20 years ago where I was from, it was little tubs of Debo. Kids were just taking two, three, four and going doing bench pressing. Yeah. Seriously, they never had a fucking clue. Like, obviously everything's changed now. You've got Sush, you've got Clint, we've got, uh, is it Snecker? Yeah, so the, the, most, the most common injectables that you get are variations of testosterone which come in come in different half life so how quickly it enters your system and how quickly it leaves growth your system. as well yeah so growth hormone doesn't really have there's not there's not there's not a high risk of negatives with growth hormone it's super expensive it is almost always fake and how do you know the difference you wouldn't so from some, some, some somebody who spends a lot of time exporting steroids and importing steroids and growth hormone i can tell you that even the stuff that looks medical grade is copied. I had a, a friend of mine who I won't name had, he was getting kits, the medical kits, the, the, the proper ones that, you know, the, the Pfizer, the Genopens and sending them out to China and having them replicated perfectly to the point where you literally couldn't tell the difference. And that's what the bulk of the industry is because, because growth hormone is so expensive. So for a, a single growth hormone pen, you're paying anywhere between, I don't know, 80 and 180 pound. Mm. So it's worth copying and they put literally nothing in it. So the, the risks with growth hormone aren't really that high. Chances are you're going to be paying a lot of money for something you're putting in your body and it's, it, it's fake. So you're not doing anything. The risk to reward on growth hormone, it's not what everyone thinks. It's not this big wonder drug. It will help with, you know, replenishing your, you know, your, your, your injuries and recovering and stuff like that. But testosterone abuse is a whole different kettle of fish. And you have... Does it make you feel good? Growth hormone. Yes. Testosterone makes you feel on top of the world. Is there a crash with it? If you come off it, there is a huge crash. So the, the, the problem with testosterone is if you start your testosterone therapy and you stop suddenly, now your body stops producing its own testosterone because you're replacing it with synthetic. So your body stopped producing testosterone and now you've stopped feeding it synthetic testosterone. So for that window, which is usually three to six months, depending on how much you've abused, you're flatlined. So all you have is this concoction of female hormones going all around and you suffer depression, you'll get suicidal tendencies, you'll get muscle wastage, you'll feel lethargic, your sex drive will go to shit. You'll be absolutely broken as a man. You, for, you know, for all intents and purposes, you are a, a, a menstruating woman who's going through hell. And that is, you know, that, that really brings a high risk of suicide when people are like, you know, when people go through that process. And that, again, is something that a lot of people aren't aware of. And there is, with testosterone, it's not, it's not so much a case of more is more or more is better. Your body can only utilize so much of it. So once you go over a certain point, your body then starts converting it into estrogen which can cause you all kinds of issues. That's when you get your, your you know, your, your bitch tits and your, your big bloated face and your acne and everything else. That's usually a telltale sign of someone that's, that's abusing steroids. But people don't want to hear that. As I say, we speak to Big Dave in the gym. Big Dave says, take 10 of these and you take 10 of these or you'll take your deep ball and then, you know, you, you get your misconceptions of, well, tablets must be safer than needles because needles are clearly a dirty thing to do. Because straight away you think needles, you associate it with heroin and crack and whatever else. But injectable testosterone is the cleanest way to do it. If you start taking tablets and then you're damaging your liver and your kidneys as it's trying to break it down. So, you, you know, you, you get people who will stay away from the injectable side of things and they'll just jump into taking loads of tablets thinking that's the safest way, but they want to take more. So they take excessive amounts of tablets. So you end up with serious kidney damage, liver, dam uh, liver damage, plus all the hormonal implications that come with it. There is a... There is a, a a very fine line between medical applications of using testosterone, which in all honesty, most men would benefit from taking testosterone. And Can we raise that naturally? See, I read something years ago, I don't know if it was true, like training your legs, does that really yeah, so, so, testosterone? So, so, yeah, that so, tra so tra training your legs will stimulate your nat natural testosterone production and your natural growth hormone production. There are ways to do it naturally. Of course there are. Is it better to do it naturally than to take it synthetically? Of course it is. If you can, if you can achieve that, fantastic. A lot of people get stuck in the rut though of 
not getting enough sleep to even allow their body to produce enough testosterone. Yeah, I'm five hours, six hours sleep a night. I know I'm getting old, don't I? I'm nearly 40. I know that the energy levels have dropped. I understand that. I'm trying to push myself to do more, but so, just at that age, mate, I feel lethargic that, that, that I don't get great sleeps five, six hours. Like I say, I'm up at fucking six, five. Yeah. No matter if I go to my bed at one or ten, I, I'm, I'm up that five, six hour mark. And sure. it's, it's hard. Medically, do you think that's be, my test dropping? Medically, you would be prime candidates for testosterone <laughs> therapy. And, it, and if you were in the States, they'd be throwing it at you. And, and what happens is, there's a, we've got a professor in the UK, I think, he, I think he's out of, I think he's out of Oxford, uh, Dr. Matthew Walker, his name is, and he's a, he's a neuroscientist, but he's the, he's one of the world's leading voices on sleep science. And he talks about testosterone and the link between sleep and testosterone production. And he says that, for anybody that that says that they can function 100 percent on i think it's less than six and a half hours sleep he said they're lying not only are they lying to you they're lying to themselves he said statistically there is there is a there is a a, a gene alteration that only a certain percentage of the population have who can function on that low amount of sleep and, and statistically you've got more chance of being hit by lightning twice than you have of having this gene of being able to function at 100 percent on sub six hours sleep and he, he says uh, i forget the exact number but say the difference between a six hour sleep and a five and a half hour sleep means you will end up having the 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 testosterone levels of a man 10 years your senior so if you're only getting five hours of sleep a night statistically you're producing as much testosterone as somebody 10 years older than you and that's the dangers of people not resting enough. And that, that's where stuff comes in. So good and well, you can train your legs, you can eat well, you can run, you, you know, you, you can keep your fluids up and everything else. But if you're not getting enough sleep, what's it all for? And, and that, that's, where the, that's where the generally becomes a need for the medical application of testosterone. And See, I always use the excuse I was working too hard and I'm overthinking, I need to work more. But I just know now that my test is dropping. And we're all, we're all guilty of it, especially especially those of us who are, are, are workaholics and we're on the go all the time. And it's easy to fall into that trap and you don't, you don't want to give up another two hours of your day to sleep because yeah. you love the hustle and bustle of it. And and that's, you know, it's become, it's become an easier to, to test for things like this. You can go, you can go with companies like, like Medichex and uh, Newman and stuff like that, where you can pay £30 and they will post you a test and you prick your finger and you put your blood in the, the thing and they'll come back and they'll tell you what your levels are. And that's, I think, for the sake of thirty pound, getting yourself a, a, an MOT like that, is well worth the money. Yeah, I'm going to do that after this. It, yeah, because <laughs> it's uh, like obviously you can get stem cells or other st stuff now. To I'm at that age, I want to look after myself more. In my twenties, I was just a fucking raging junkie. Do you know what I mean? It was just yeah. coke, booze, gas. It was just all the the external stuff to. But then when you get older, like, I don't. I see people running in marathons in their fifties and sixties. Like you can clearly still have a great life and positive life. Well, and you can hit your peak in your fifties, your sixties, your seventies. There's still people learning new things every day. Like at old ages, like I don't want to be one of those guys who quit and just accept yeah. and just be in that little life of existing. We've got we've got a chap in our gym, and I won't name him, but. Those in the gym will know who I'm talking about, and he's he's 82 or 83 years of age, yeah. And he is he's two years older than my grandfather. Yeah, my grandfather doesn't have the strength to hold a full bottle of milk. He can't close the car door. He's he, you know he's frail. He spends most of his time sat in a chair watching television. He, he's 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 still super switched on upstairs. Fasc fascinating, hyper intelligent, but physically he, he's. You know, he, he's 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 finished. Whereas this chap that we got in the gym was 82 years of old, 82 years of age. He's in the gym every day. He takes testosterone. He looks 20 years younger than my grandfather. And he gets about the gym using all the machines. He's dead happy. He's dead energetic. This guy is 82 years of age. And he did some of the TV stuff with us through COVID. And he is, he is just, you know, the, the, the personification of what a difference it can make if you actually look after yourself and the quality of life that you can you know, have extended if you take care of yourself. You could you could very easily get to 55, 60, retire, spend 10 hours, 12 hours a day sat in the sofa watching daytime television and you become frail and old. And you, you, you're, you know, by the time you're 70, you're completely finished. Whereas if you look after yourself, you know, you, you can have a, a good quality of life 
well into your 80s, maybe even up to your 90s. And, and you know, we, 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 I'm the same as you when I was younger. I didn't care. Taking loads of steroids, McDonald's every day, which, you know, everything in moderation is fine. But when you're in your early 20s, you don't care. I'm not thinking about when I'm 40 or when I'm 50 or when I'm 60. But then when you start getting into your 30s and approaching 40 and early 40s, it's, fuck, I wish I'd have done that differently. Yeah. So the earlier you have that realization, the better it is going to be and the, and the you know the longer you can live for. And I, as I say, I think it's important people do have these checks. And I think it's important that people focus on getting this. Yeah, it's long, And that, so you've kind of went through that life. You've you've had the positives been in nature parkour traveling around the world you had seemed to have figured it all out as if i've not got any pain anymore you've got your family slipped again steroids prisons bouncer selling gear that so when you're in prison you had that realization when your photos and start, stuff started changing was that the moment you decided right was that is that the, you all get that little light bulb and say right something comes into your mind whether we act on it, it's a different fucking ball game. Like when I was doing my shit, like I, every day I wanted to change. I just couldn't because I was so used to that life. The subconscious yeah. mind would remind me who I was because I'd done it for so long. So when you're in prison, like when you're changing your photos, was that the moment, the size of moment in your life? That was the moment. There was, there was no point in the 12, 18 months leading up to me getting caught that I think I'm doing the wrong thing here. And when my good people started to drop off around me, as far as I was concerned, they were the issue. It wasn't me. I couldn't see it. I was completely lost. And I'd come away and I had that realization. And what really mattered to me started to change. And I started to remember, you know, how, how good I felt prior to getting into all that. And the, you know, uh, it, 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 I was like, I woke, I, I completely, I completely changed both inside and outside in terms of my appearance and everything else, just from that, that moment of realization with the pictures, that was it for me then. I was like, this, this, this life isn't for me. And you look around and you, you meet people in prison who are on their fifth, sixth, seventh sentence and they're in their forties or their fifties. And you think, I don't want to be this guy. There's no, no amount of money in the world is worth being in this place at all. Never mind when you're 50 years of age. And you, you know, I, I look back to when I was younger. So before we found the fame through parkour and free run, and even when we were digging digging foods out in bins at the back of Tesco, I was happier digging through the bins at Tesco than I was just before I come to jail. Like the level of satisfaction I was getting out of life at thirteen, scrounging for food, was better than what I had at twenty one, buying brand new Range Rovers and fancy watches and everything else because it just did, it just felt numb. So when I've gone through that realization, I thought, right, this is, I'm completely done with this. I'm done with this life. I'm not interested. And I had that realization quite early on. I was in my first year and I still had two years to go. So the two years that followed, you know, I, 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 I took some time. I educated myself. I reconnected with a lot of my old friends, you know, and I, I really got myself back into a, a strong, positive mindset. And then, you know, pushing towards the, the end of my sentence. I was I was ready to come home. I, f I felt really good about myself coming home. I was energized. I'd spent three years in a concrete box. You know, I'd gone through the Jersey prison system. I'd, I'd got to HMP Liverpool, which was a, an eye-opener in itself. I've come from eight months in Jersey and this prison is ahead of its time. You know, the technology, everything, every, you're on first name terms with the staff, you know, it's Sarah, Dave, I've had that for eight months and then I transferred to Liverpool and I'm in the GOA mean sweat box, you know, with the little window at the side and we pull up at HMP Liverpool and you can only see out the corner of the window and you just see this five story high Victorian looking Shawshank type building and that, that's when it hits, you know, wow, this, this is actually prison. And I get into HMP Liverpool and that place is, is absolutely terrifying and i thought i was i was big man at the time do you know what i mean as i say 115 kilo i'm on the doors i love fighting all the time and you know i'm, I'm mixing with gangs guns all of it you get to hmp liverpool and you feel about an inch big because it doesn't matter who you are or what you think you are or who you know or what you've done everyone is the same you know it's a hide you have drama with somebody you are in that hostile environment day in, day out. So it doesn't matter if you can handle yourself or anything, you just become completely insignificant. 
and, and, and life is cheap and that having that realization i'd already come to the point where it's like i never want to be here again and that was when i was in the holiday camp that was jersey and i get to hmp liverpool and it was fuck <laughs> wow i ain't never doing this again so progress through the system i got to the open prisons you know i was doing the the home leaves and the you know the going home and doing the workouts and ticked all the boxes and just before about two or three months before I was due to get released, the the guy that owns our local gym, Paul, he was a friend of mine from obviously before going away from my, you know, from my bodybuilding career. And I get talking to him and he says, look, Nick, I'm, I'm selling the gym. I'm going back up to Glasgow. Me and him and his partner, Emma, were from Glasgow and they'd opened this gym in our area in 2013 or whatever. And they said, look, her, her parents are starting to get older, they're unwell, I'm looking to sell the gym. He just dropped it in conversation. I was like, well, what do you want for it? And he tells me to figure it. I was like, why didn't you ask me? He's like, well, I didn't think you were in that kind of position. I said, well, let me see what I can do. And I had a bit of money left over. And I I just reconnected with my mum for the first time in a, in a lot of years. Why did you fall out? We just, we, we drifted apart. Like we never had a, a, a super close relationship. It was very much a, a brother and sister relationship more than a mother and son. Is that because she was so young? Or did yeah, I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because she was so young and I, and I've spoken about this in stuff I've done in the press and she's took offense to it and we've fallen out again since because she's, she remembers my childhood very differently to what I do. And I think she's, she's, I think she's done that to protect herself from the truth of, of you know, what, what the experience was really like. And, and I understand that. And I, when I talk about it, I, I, I never, I never mean to, to, to demonize her in the slightest. Because... Yeah, it's actually, she was a bad mama. Yeah. Those parents in those days can only teach you what they know. Do you know what I mean? Like... Exactly. And she was 15. Mm -hmm. I, I couldn't have been a parent of 15. And I, I'm 38, mate, and I still fucking struggle. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't think it, you know, I, I, can't, I couldn't hold anything against her. And the flexibility that she gave me enabled me to go on the journey that I did. And looking back through everything into where I am now, I wouldn't change a single thing. So I really appreciate the hardship that we went through and the approach that she had for me, even though that's not why she did, you know, the way that she did. Like, I remember when I was like 14, I, I went and I, I'd, I'd met some American guys on the internet and some guys from France and I ended up deciding, right, okay, I want to go over to France and meet these guys. So I just, I just disappeared. I got one of my mates to take me down to London, one of my older mates, bunk me on the Eurostar. I goes to France on my own. This is a 14. I met up with all these random strangers I'd met on the internet who were like five, six years older than me. And we went and toured around the, you know, the, the founding town of parkour. And I went and met all like the original, all the original athletes, like the founders of the sport. And this is a 14. I get back. She didn't even know I'd gone. I'd been gone for about a week. She didn't even realize I'd gone. You know what I mean? And that, and that's, uh, and that flexibility enabled me. It could have gone so much, it could have gone worse. Do you know what I mean? I'm meeting random men off the internet in different countries at 14. Like that could have gone horrifically, but it didn't. Yeah. How was your trust with men? Especially what you went through as a kid. Was it just a case of you blocked everything out? I blocked out? it out completely. Yeah. And I really didn't process that at all up until I, I seen this psychiatrist when I was in the open prison, Thorn Cross, like that, that had been, I hadn't even thought about it for 15 years. And then I spoke about it with that psychiatrist and it wasn't until 2018 that I told my grandparents for the first time. How did they react? They were, they were really upset because they, they, they knew we struggled. They knew I spent, you know, they knew I struggled for food because often we, there was a, there was a local Italian restaurant and me and Kyle used to go and rob the, like these big 25 kilo sacks of potatoes from there. And then we'd go and knock on me nan's door and ask for a tin of beans. Do you know what I mean? And we, we, we lived rough and the bedroom that me and Kyle shared because his mum had disowned him as well. We shared uh, two single mattresses on the floor. They were battered in, the, in this bedroom and we fended for ourselves. And when we were, when I was like 12, the way I used to make money is we used to play this game online, uh, Legend of Mare, it was called like similar to like World of Warcraft or something like that. And I was impersonating a woman at 12 years old and I'm chatting to these guys from Saudi Arabia, like relatives of the, the royal family. And I'm, <clears throat> where I'm, I'm spending all, all nights hunting with these guys and chatting and pretending to be this woman, absolutely catfishing. And then I build this, build this trust up and we'd be, you know, this would be going on like two months. And then I come up with the story of, oh, I've got to stop playing the game. I've got to take a, I've got to take up a part-time job to pay for my university fees. Um, and they'd be like, oh, you know, don't go, don't go, or, you know, I'll send you some money or whatever else. And I've done this with a few, few different fellas on there and they'd be sending me like, this is via Western Union or MoneyGram, I can't remember where it was, I was about 12 at the time. 
and they're sending me these two, three, four thousand pounds money grams uh, over in the post. So I, you know, I'm 12 years old, you know, and I'm, I'm we've got money now. Do you know what I mean? So you know, we had a couple of years where it was really rough. Then we'd have, then you know, we make a couple of grand and. As you do at that age, that just gets spent on Nike tracksuits and you know a load of McDonald's, and then you're back at square one again. But I loved every minute of it, every minute of the journey. Do you know what I mean? And that that that, that that's something that I'll always be grateful for with my mum. That that neglect is also what's enabled me to be so different from everybody else. Because a lot of people who I grew up with, and you know, some of them are happy, some of them aren't, and none of them really went on to achieve what I thought they would. And the people who were like the, the you know, the the promising people in school haven't really gone on to do much with their life, which which isn't which isn't the biggest measure of life. Like, uh, you know, I'll, I'll say to anyone, it doesn't matter what you've got or what you've done. If you're happy, you know, you've won at life. But a lot of the people that I went to school with who, who look like, you know, they were going to do big things, have gone on to have mundane lives, with mundane jobs, and they're miserable. And to know that I've come from where I've come from and I'm in a place now where, yes, I'm, I'm wealthy now. Yes, I'm successful now, but that's, that, that's, that's secondary. I'm, I'm happy and I've gone through a lot of hardships and I'm really happy and I'm in a really good place and I can pass that on. I'm in a position where I can pass that on to my friends and my family and that's, you couldn't buy that yeah, with, all the pri with all the right. private schooling, with all the, you know, with, with all the, the leg up all the legs up in life that you could get from, from affluent parents or, or caring parents. Like I, you could never have purchased that. Yeah. So when you got, he used to sell in the gym then. And you, so, and you're... so yeah, so I reconnected with my mum at this point and I'm talking, talking to my grandmother. I had a bit of money myself and long story short, I ended up taking a loan from my mum, a loan from my gran, put my own money in and still couldn't come up with the amount that he wanted for the gym. I had about half. And I said to him, look, I said, any chance you'd let me buy half of it and I will slowly buy you out as we go. And he was in a rush to get back up north at this point. He needed to get back to Glasgow. He was like, Nick, okay, let's do it. So I took half the business off him. I took 50% of the business. And from there, I've just lived off tuna and noodles for three years. So minimalistic is my thing at this point. I don't need to buy anything, don't need to spend anything. I can live minimal. So every penny that I made from wages and every penny that I got as a split of the profits went straight to buying more shares, more shares, more shares. And I brought in, when I got into the, when I, when I bought the gym, it was, it had that bodybuilding mentality as I was talking about, you know, through my own experience of vanity and everybody was against each other. And I, I, I completely got rid of that culture and pushed in my old free running parkour community of everyone needs to push everyone to do better. Everyone needs to network more. Everyone needs to give each other help tips. So to encourage people to, to network on social media and it completely transformed the environment in the gym. It's gone from being this hostile CD bodybuilding gym to we've got a really good community here. So business goes up and I had Paul bought out within, it must've been about eight or nine months and the gym was completely mine then. And I was in a really good place. And this takes us up to maybe the end of 2018, early 19. And I'd gone, I was still on license at this time. And I'd gone, the gym's doing really well. My clothing brand's doing really well. Gets to the summer of 2019. And I'd been, I'd been traveling in and out of the country. My, my license condition said, you can't leave the country full stop. That, that's, a, that's a standard condition. You can't leave the country. Now, I'd left the country about 30 times at this point, and I'd just been traveling, not, not, not doing anything shady. I was just going backpacking around Asia, rock climbing, whatever else. Gets to July 2019, and I'd, I'd agreed to take in a young lad into the gym. You know, about 15, my best mate Kylo, I mentioned earlier, it was his little brother. He'd been having trouble on the estate. He's only 15. That lad's come through the front window with machete. He's trying to attack him because he's, he's selling a bit of weed or whatever else. And he said, look, can you take him? He needs to be away from the house. Look, he's not living with me. I'm on license. So tell you what, I'll put him in the office upstairs in the gym. I'll turn that into a bedroom. He can stay there. He'd be locked after. Moves him in the gym. And social services vet me. The police vet me. He said, right, we think you're a great role model. Okay, he can stay with you. Every three weeks, his mum has a meeting with social services, police, and a few other entities to check he's okay. Now... This is July, 2019. Now I'd come back over to Asia. They have this meeting with the police. Uh, and his mum says, look, just to let you know, Nick's not here at the minute, but the staff are looking after Ethan. Everything's fine. And the police officer sat in the room. He said, what do you mean Nick's not here? She's like, oh, he's in, he's in Japan. How's Nick in Japan if he's not allowed to leave the country? 
So I get to call when I'm in Tokyo off for basins. He's like, look, you're going back to jail. So it comes back from Manchester airport and I had a, a full squad of police waiting for me. So it goes back to Liverpool for a recall for a month. And it was like water off a duck's back. I was like, you know what? I've had two years of traveling, not bothered, dealt with it. It was in a good place, got back out. And then we slowly get towards pandemic times now when we're approaching March, 2020, was it? And the pandemic hits and we had to close in the national lockdown, which, which we did and in the first national lockdown, we closed our doors. Nobody knew what it was. Nobody knew how serious it was going to be. And it would have been, it would have been reckless to do anything other than but close. So we closed our doors and we gave, we gave all of our equipment away to all our members basically said, look, come and take whatever you want. I trust you. We've got this community. We've got this rapport. You take everything that you want, bring it back when this ends. And that's exactly what happened. And all our members took that and the gym got stripped bare. You're talking like 60, 70, 80 grand away of the kit. Anything that could come off the floor went to people's houses. And as a, as a, an unintended con consequence of that, everyone kept paying their memberships. So we had everybody's memberships coming in. We had the bursaries off the government and everything else. So we did better through the first lockdown than we'd have done if we were open, um, which, you know, it's hard not to feel guilty for that when so many businesses, you know, did, did so poorly because we had that rapport with our members and we could say, look, we trust you, take what you want. And we did really well through that. And then we come out of lockdown and then they bring in the tier system at the end of 2020. So this takes us to probably the first or second week of October, 2020. And there's an announcement made on the news that Liverpool's due to be the first city in the country to be put into tier three, tier three restrictions. Now, nobody really knew what that meant at the time because everything was so fresh and they, they published the legislation online. And Boris goes on TV and he gives this speech of, gives the list of the sectors that need to close immediately. And it was nail salons, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Gymnasiums are all set to close in two days time. That's it, that's that. Now I, look, I read through the legislation that they published online and there was no mention of gyms. So I thought this has got to be an oversight. He's put that in there, not knowing that it wasn't included in there. So I had a conversation with one of our other local gym owners, uh, two of them, in fact, Chris and Thea. And I said, look, we said, this is the situation. This is what we know. There's nothing in there to say that we need to close legally. What do we do? And this went back and forth for a few hours and we were like, you know what? Let's do it. Let's let's take a stance. Let's let's stay open. So two days before we were due to be forced to close, we both put videos up on social media saying it's wrong. The legislation doesn't say this is what's meant to happen. We're not going to close. And I'm still on license at this point. So I thought I get arrested. I'm going back to jail. I didn't have long left on my license. I had about a month left. But I thought I'm probably going to end up going back to jail. But if we're gonna if we're gonna do this and we're gonna do it for the right reasons. It is what it is. So we took this stance, I put this video up, said we're not closing. And then within 24 hours, I think that video had like four or five million views. So we had the police there the next day. Oh, we believe you don't intend to close tomorrow. Just need to let you know that we are gonna come and find you if you don't, blah, blah, blah. And I had a really good relationship with the police. Like I, I had done from my free running days, we used to deal with them every day because we were on rooftops. I said, look, fellas, that's your job. I appreciate that. You know, but you're not gonna get any argument from me. You do what you need to do. I'll be decent with it. You be decent with me. That's that. And they leave. And the following morning was the first day that we were due to close in tier three. And this would have been October 15th, 2020. Police attend the gym eight o'clock in the morning. And there was maybe 10 officers from the armed division of Liverpool's police. So the, the, the whole, the whole idea from what I could perceive at least was intimidation. We're going to send a full squad down, make them feel intimidated, make sure they close, and that will be the end of it. So they, they they turn up, and there's 10 police officers, and they're all got the big fancy yellow tasers on, and they said, you need to close immediately, you know, or you're going to get a £1,000 fine. You know, so I, I phoned Chris and Theo, I said, look, are we doing this? Are we in? Because they're in front of me right now. I'm about to be fined. Are we in? Don't let me do this on my own. Like if, if we're in, we're in, if we're not, we're not, tell me now. And they said, let's, let's do it. We're in, we're behind you all the way. Let's do it. Okay. So we said, I said to the police officer, I said, look, chaps, no disrespect. I'm going to film this interaction right now when we go pro. I said, so do yourselves a favor, stand whatever distance apart you need to. I don't want to get you in trouble. This is just for me to document it. So it films them. 
films them in the gym, panned around the mall, panned up to our people's gym sign at the back, went home, took the thousand pound fine, went home, made a video about it. And that again, we go viral again. And from there, everything just rocketed to the point where within within the first 24 hours of, of having the gym open, I'd been contacted by CNN, ITV, Channel 4, New York Times. Like it, it, it was it was absolute chaos. And we'd gotten in touch with some of our local MPs, our local mayor, and said, look, we've read through this legislation. This is wrong. Because Boris, Boris was then blaming it on, he said the decision to close gyms was left to the local MPs and the local mayor. So I, I contacted them on Twitter and was like, what are you doing? And they've said, oh, this has nothing to do with us. They've done it. I was like, well, he's pointing at you. You're pointing at them. Who is it? So I just put this video up and basically called them out and said, look, we've got one side telling us it's them, the other saying it's them. What, what do we do now? And that's when we launched the petition. And off the back of the petition, we had a ton of celebrities get on board because everybody was sympathetic to, to the situation because well, nobody wanted to be in lockdown. You know, the, the, there's fair arguments on both sides as to, you know, what extent we should or shouldn't have locked down. But everybody was sympathetic to the cause and got behind us, launched the petition. We ended up with 650,000 signatures on this petition. All of a sudden, they couldn't ignore us now. We're on headline news multiple times a day. I had interviews, live interviews with TV, one straight into another. This goes on for like three days. And at this point, we'd now closed the front entrance to the gym because the police were attending 10, 15 times a day now. And they said, we can give you this thousand pound fine, but when we come back, it's going to be a 2000 and it doubles every time until it gets to 10,000 and we can do it every three hours. So it was a case of every three hours, they could give us a 10,000 pound fine. So we're, okay, well, we can't keep the front door open. So we kept the back door open. So every time the police had turned up, we hired extra staff to monitor the cameras. And any time the police had turned up, we'd see them on the cameras. We'd turn the music right down and they'd come and they'd check the doors and they'd leave. And it got to the point where they were coming out that much and they knew exactly what was going on. The police had come to the door and they'd push on the door and they'd look up at the camera and go, getting off. <laughs> and it, it, we, we, we developed a really good relationship with the police and they were hyper aware of the fact that any video I was taking at the time was getting millions of views. So they were very, you know, they, they were very cautious in how they approached it, but they were sympathetic. Anytime I'd speak to them, they were like, look, we don't want to be doing this. We know you're in the right. We, we've, we've heard everything that you've said on, on TV and, and in the newspapers and you write the legislation doesn't say anything about you needing to close. You, you shouldn't be. So we had the, we had the, we had the support of the police and we had the local mayor in my in my DMs on Twitter saying, "Look, I'm 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 behind you. What can we do?" So we we, we banged on. We we hit the petition over and over again, and then we eventually eventually went up to meet uh, Sir Lindsay Hoyle, Speaker of the House of Commons. Went up to Chorley to meet him personally to get this petition fast tracked, and that that was a surreal experience. Off off the back of having only been out of prison a couple of years. Now I'm sat in front of one of the most influential politicians in, in some back office in Chorley. And he's like, listen, I completely, I completely get where you're coming from. He said, I, I've listened to all the statistics that you put forward on mental health and physical health and the damage that this is going to do. He said, uh, you know, I, I lost my daughter to suicide last year and she was a keen gym goer. And, you know, that was her only outlet for her stress and depression. And he said, this is what I'm going to do. He said, when you leave here, I'm going to call the prime minister personally. And I'm going to tell him that this, this petition needs to be heard immediately. And we left and within an hour, we've been contacted to say, right, the, the debate's going to be heard on Monday. So we got that. And then over the weekend, over the weekend, I got news that it was being overturned. This is before it had even happened. I got news over the weekend to say, look, you, you have won. It's going to be announced on early next week. That's you're going to be allowed to open. You, you've, you've beaten them, basically. Um, so this happens, and I, and I put a video up. I got I, I seen the message in the morning, and I got the call, and I, I put this video up on social media, and I was I was hyper emotional, and I'm sobbing my eyes out in my dressing gown, taking this video. In hindsight, I should have put something else on because they ended up using this video on national news. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm looking rough as fuck in my dressing gown, sobbing my eyes out like a, like a 10-year-old girl. But we did it, we beat them and it, they were gonna reverse it. And the date that they were due to reverse it was the 23rd of October, which just happened to be my 30th birthday. So the day that we got the victory was on my 30th birthday. And that same day, 
I got published on the in the New York Times, made front page of the New York Times on my thirtieth birthday, and and like to to round the, to round the journey off up to that point of you know everything everything that I'd I'd been through to then now I've been on national news in nearly every country from you know from Russia to Singapore everywhere in the UK front page of the New York Times like I, it it felt so surreal and my 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 Instagram DMs were crazy I had celebrities that I've idolized for years popping up offering help and it it it, it was so it was so difficult to manage and it was difficult to manage emotionally and I was I was hellbent on the fact that we needed to respond to every single message every single DM and at the time we were getting somewhere in the region of five and ten thousand DMs on my personal Instagram a day so we had there was four of us working around the clock just responding to my DMs I had me and three of my pals literally working round the clock shifts responding to every single DM and it, it, it you know, it took a it took a massive toll on me psychologically. It took a massive toll on the team, but you know, we we inevitably we did the right thing, and you know, we were gym access was then given back to if it was about seven, six or seven million people who were put into tier three at one point who would have had their access restricted had it not been for everything that we did. Why do you think the gyms were one of the last to open? When you've got McDonald's open, you've got all the shit. Takeaways open. That like, why do you think the gym was one of the last to open? Money talks, unfortunately. And when you have commercial entities like McDonald's that have a lot of political influence, I mean, look at the look at the eat out to help out scheme. Now, I mean, my 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 statistics are a bit rusty now because it's been a long time since I've thought or spoke about them. But the link between obesity and just generally being overweight and critical illness with COVID is as black and white as it gets. If you are overweight, you're like 119% more likely to become critically ill from from COVID. You're, you're you know, 200% more likely to be hospitalized. So we've got all these statistics linking obesity to critical illness with, not just with COVID, but with, you know, with most, with most illnesses, most influenzas. When you're overweight or obese, you're, immune system is compromised. If your immune system is compromised, you're going to suffer more severely from any illness. So our response to that is to endorse an eat out to help out scheme where you can go and get your McDonald's a 50% off and then you're told to go home and isolate in your house. So, you know, we're, we're feeding into this, feed into this circle of, of, you know, self-inflicted punishments. And we, we seen more, damage from COVID between the United Kingdom and the United States, we had a, 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 it hurt us more than it hurt any other country in the world because we are side by side with the United States of having the most over, overweight population in the world because we abuse ourselves so much. And to think that our response to that was right, okay, we need to give everyone 50% off fast food is absolutely bonkers. Do you think I, it's a big plan? Not go down the conspiracy route, but just to kind of when you actually look at it all, because I think I'm, I'm same. I'm rusty with all the figures and stats, but the survival rate was basically ninety nine point something. I think under the ages of seventy five, it was like yeah, you, you you statistically there there is unless you are unless your immune system is compromised for for whatever pre existing illness, you ending up critically ill from COVID. You know, it's an almost non-existent chance. Whereas you have, and I forget the name of the professor now, he work, works out of Oxford University, Neil, I can't remember his surname. He is, so he he compiles the, the cost benefits analysis of nuclear fallouts, stuff like that. You know, when, when we should use a nuclear weapon, what the fallouts would be. So that he is an analyst, an, an analyst that specifically deals in cost benefits and, uh, uh, you know, equations and he he measured the impact of going into long-term lockdowns bearing in mind uh, you know very early on the world health organization come out and said you should never no state should ever use long-term lockdowns as a solution to a pandemic ever just shouldn't happen maybe two weeks okay fine six months you're asking for disaster and he talks this professor talks about the i don't know if it's called the 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 R value or something. As I say, I'm really rusty on it. But basically, what what he's suggesting is the 
what we save in the short term by locking down, yes, we will we will extend the lives of the, the 78, 79, 80 year olds by about 12 months. But you then take into consideration the hundreds of thousands. And I, I mean, midway through the pandemic, there was about 500,000 cancer referrals missed. This, this is just cancer referrals. So when you take into consideration the amount of, you know, uh, cancer diagnoses that we've missed and how many years of someone's life that will take, we are, we have absolutely messed this up because if you're going to, if you're going to say well, what, what's, what's more important and, and people will say a life is a life, but what's more important to save a five-year-old's life or an 83-year-old's life? Yeah, you've got a young life, Unfortunately, you. you've got, if, if, if there's a train coming and you have an old woman and a, and a, and a five-year-old girl in front of it and you only save one, yeah, you're I, I'm you're sorry, but yeah, the, 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 you know, the, the, the moral stance of, oh, one life's worth as much as the other, it, it's not. If you're 83 years of age, you've lived a great life. And I had this conversation with my with my grandparents who were both still alive at the time. They're like, we've lived our lives. Like, we don't want you giving this up for this, for us to live an extra 12 months. And the, the, the comprehensive study that he did was, was absolutely fascinating. It was like, we have caused 20 years worth of serious damage now with, with what we've got with the NHS, NHS backlog. You know, we, we've exacerbated the obesity situation. We were already, obesity was already costing us Costing the NHS, the NHS alone in excess of nine billion a year, thirty billion to wider society, and they are terrifying stats. And then for a year and a half, we've locked everybody down permanently, fed them fast food, and said you're not allowed out to exercise. So all we've done is cripple the NHS further. Whether that's deliberate or not is an entirely different conversation. That uh, you still people are still struggling, but when you actually think what went down, but we're in a mask to walk into a restaurant but take it off when you sit down like that's fucking common sense what's going on yeah. like, I ain't a scientist or a, I'm a doctor same as yourself but it's just a bit of common sense like, I was still climbing mountains I was still doing things and the shit that I used to get but I knew my mental health was slipping I can't sit in the house and it's not to be selfish I was away from everybody I had to be out in nature I had to keep myself busy like, and the amount of the businesses that are still closed down now like the Suicide went through the roof, alcohol abuse went through the roof, yep. domestic abuse domestic, went through yep. the roof, like everything else went through the roof and for a a virus that the percentage of deaths wasn't that high. No, not And people so. go off their nut then. I think a lot of people have woken up to it now, but they have now and it's a little bit it's, it's fucking late. It's a little 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 too yeah, it's too little too late, unfortunately. And as you say, we had we had, you know, child mental health cases at, at record highs, record highs, suicides at record high, record highs. Like it, it the, the statistics were terrible uh, terrifying. And I I did a I did a documentary with The Guardian through COVID and I, and I referenced my time in prison. I was like, look, the, the biggest punishment that we can do to somebody in this country by law is put them in prison. And the biggest punishment you can get in prison is to be put in isolation. And you're telling me the healthiest thing for this country to do right now is isolate. That's the most severe punishment we've got in this country, shy of having capital punishment. So you're basically inflicting the most serious punishment upon every single person in this country and asking them to go home, stay at home, stay on their own and just sit and watch BBC news all day long about people dying. And, you know, it, it's mortifying and they, and they went so far with it. And the government's even got penalized by, by Ofcom on an advert they did. They had these huge billboards in London saying, uh, the runner next to you most likely has COVID. And it, was, and it was literally a billboard, a 30 foot billboard, maybe even bigger, of an image of somebody running and this caption next to it, the runner next to you most likely has COVID. Ofcom made them take that down and that's the extremes they went to. And you even had the BBC putting pictures up on how to have safe sex through COVID and a picture of a couple wearing masks, completely naked face to face, wearing masks, having sex, exchanging all manner of bodily fluids and that. I'm like, what, what, what is going on? But fear is a mad thing. Like that's it is. why the world does control by fear. And I see people still wearing masks. I see people sitting in their car wearing a mask, like wearing the same mask for months. What do you think the germs that have in that? Like, it's just to open your own eyes. Like I get, like you want to protect the elderly and protect us, but now they're starting to give vaccines, and even we don't want to dive too deep in it. But the vaccines themselves and how they were created and how fast they were created and the money behind it and who's behind it, like. You can go on all day and go right down the rabbit hole. But all that stuff of you stepping out of the plate, getting worldwide attention because of your past as well, 
and then obviously back in prison do you think there was a connection <laughs> of you stepping up to the government or was it just a case of look you were well, a bad boy back in the day we're coming back to get you or do you think or, or is there a connection i think there's definitely a connection and and we're into we're into july 2021 and between all of that happening in october 2020 to july 21 i'd gone on to do weekly appearances on tv campaigning for mental health physical health i'd got on board as brian rose's health and well-being advisor in his campaign to be london mayor you know i'd done i'd done so much you know i pushed the workout to help out scheme you know got that to the floors of parliament i was doing everything i possibly could to promote physical and mental health i'd done so much charity work and i was so proud of everything that i'd done and we get to july 2021 <clears throat> and we hear his big banging on the door first thing in the morning and i you know i i i pushing my, my partner jade at the time and i'm nudging her and i'm like it's just going to be another asos delivery for you get out of bed and answer the bloody door sends her downstairs to get to, to get this what i assumed was a parcel anyway and the next thing i hear is mercy side police and i thought it's just covid related again I've, I, I, over that 12 months i'd had about 100 interactions with the police and they were all decent i thought what is it this time anyway they comes up the stairs we've got an arrest warrant i said well what for what's going on now oh it's from uh jersey police I said okay I said i haven't spoken to anybody from jersey in years and i said so what, what's this about and they wouldn't tell me anything he said look they either didn't want to tell me or they genuinely didn't know anything but they they were they took the stance of we know nothing and you know they they searched the house they searched the gym they found absolutely nothing because it's been years since i've done anything so it takes me to the police station <clears throat> and it was only merseyside police this time that had got me and jersey customs were flying over the following day apparently so they still couldn't tell me nothing customs come over get me and they tells me on the plane i had you know i had a long conversation with them i said what what is this about you know what what is it that's going on they were like oh you'll find out when you get there find out when you get there lands meets the lead customs agent and he's like it's for an import of cannabis 2018 uh, with an anthony dryden and the penny drops straight away then i knew exactly what it was and to to skip forward a little bit i get gets gets the prison gets the jersey prison charged in fact tell a lie no i was bailed so i was bailed on the friday i seized the magistrates prosecution stand up give their give their spiel look we're not we're not concerned that nick's gonna interfere with the ongoing investigation it's three years old you know we're, we're you know we're not no objection to bail my solicitor stands up duty advocate says look nick's done all this with his life you know look at all these articles everything he's doing with mental health give him the bail um so they agreed to my bail on the friday and they bailed me for the weekend on the condition that i come back on the monday and i have a tag fitted and i stay on tag whilst i'm on bail <clears throat> so it comes back to court monday morning a solicitor says look we're going to be in and out in 60 seconds it's a formality don't worry about it um and he goes into the courtroom and it's a different magistrate for whatever reason he comes over to me he said look just just be aware it's a different magistrate and she she's known to be quite difficult i said okay he said does that change anything he said nah you'd be fine everything's fine so the same same situation goes again my solicitor stands up says look we're, we're here for a continuation of friday we're only here to get the tag fitted police are here today i couldn't get done on the friday because the officer wasn't there who fits tags he was on holiday he said he's here today we can fit the tag no problem and she hears the case and she disappears into the back room for 15 minutes and i started to get nervous at this point and she comes back into the room and this is where i got the first idea that's something you know this this seemed like there was motivation behind this and she says i'm going to ignore the fact that you were given bail on friday she said i'm treating this not as a continuation but as a fresh application and as such i'm denying you bail uh and you received six years for this last time and i believe you can expect to receive the same or more this time and bearing in mind i'd been indicted on 3.1 kilos of cannabis which to your average user who may may buy two grams a week to smoke at home may sound like a lot but to anybody that's trafficked in drugs before you you could lose three kilo down the side of your sofa do you know what i mean it, it it's buttons and the maximum sentence that that should have 
produced would have been about 14 months. So she's in magistrate court now saying I can expect six years or more. My partner Jade is in the dock crying her eyes out. I'm like, what, what the fuck has just happened? So he takes me to prison. I get my depths through quite quickly and I'm reading through all this paperwork. And what had, what had happened was in 2018, somebody that I'd met whilst I was in prison in Jersey had reached out to me, dropped me a message, said, look, I've been buying cannabis pollen from the dark web. My guy is stocked, his account's disappeared, whatever it was. Any chance you can you can sort me out? And that bearing in mind, they've got all these messages in black and white. And I said to him, listen, mate, I'm, I'm out of the game completely. I said, I can, I can put you in touch with my guy. You can do whatever between you. He's like, right, okay. So I spoke to one of my mates. I said, look, will you help him out? He's like, oh, I don't really trust him. Do us a favor. You you sit in the middle for the for, for the first one. Right, okay. Does him a favor. Sits in the middle of these three exchanges. And this only goes on for a couple of weeks. And then they ask me again. And I'm like, listen, enough's enough. I said, I do you a favor. I'm not in this game anymore. You're going to have to speak to each other directly because I don't want anything to do with this. I've got too much to lose. I'm, I'm miles away from, from, from this game. And I put them two in touch. And that's the last I ever spoke to him. Never spoke to him again. Three years go by. And that's when they come and arrest me. And from what I can see in the paperwork, they'd had this evidence for very near three years because he got arrested. My co-accused on something unrelated to me. And they went through his phone and his messages on Signal the app that we were using had backed up to his iCloud and he pulled these messages out of his iCloud. So three years have gone by now and I'm looking through this paperwork and you obviously get a, 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 a breakdown, a step-by-step -step of the investigation and what happens and who submits the statements and on what dates it happened. And there've been three years and they'd had all of this evidence for three years. They had me banged to rights. They had my, my phone number. They had pictures of my passports off my Instagram. Everything was linked in. They had more than enough evidence to act on it. And they'd done nothing for three years. And then in the February of 2021, the local press in Jersey, uh, a newspaper called the uh, Jersey Evening Post, they ran a big four spread article on me across two days on the Monday, it was a big two page spread. It was from free runner to drug runner. And then on the Tuesday, another two big spread from prison inmate to community hero and this huge write up of me and everything that I've done. And then from the timeline that you can see in my depths, it looks like just weeks after that article had come out, they then decided, right, okay, we're going to bother with this because ordinarily that quantity of can cannabis, at least cannabis pollen, which is, you know, it, it is cheaper than normal cannabis it would not be worth them coming over to the mainland to arrest someone, to spend all the money and dying somebody. It's just not worth doing. And they've seen how well I was doing and seen the potential to take assets off me and everything else and thought, now's the time to get this guy. We're going to get some, we'll get a load of press. We'll be able to see some assets, whatever else. So they waited three years and they arrested me in, in July of 2021. I got bail for three days. I go into prison and it wasn't until the, the October that I was it went for bail again and that got knocked back. And that was the first time it got put in the press properly. And ITV News ran with a ran with an article saying that I'd been indicted on importation of cannabis and money laundering offences. No context as to when it was from or anything else. So at that time, I had a, a good few big business deals going on including a contract that we were about to sign with JD Sports for my clothing brand, which was going to be possibly the, 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 the biggest, you know, the biggest business deal, business success that I ever would have had. They got cold feet. They backed away from that. Now, the article, not only did it not mention the date of the importation or, or the context of what had happened to I me, mean, don't get me wrong, I was guilty of the crime. I facilitated it. I put them two people together. And I, as you can imagine, I regret it more than anything. But the money laundering comments is what really, really got me. Now, what they charged me with is importation of cannabis and removal of criminal property. And what that means is if I give you a quantity of cannabis in one hand and you give me a quantity of cash in the other hand, that's two offenses. I've sold you the cannabis and I've also received criminal property, which is the cash for the cannabis. Now, in the entire history of Jersey law, that's always been seen as one one transaction. So the even though they are separate charges, they run side by side, they run concurrent. In the entire history of Jersey law, nobody has been given consecutive sentences for that. 
because it is one transaction. And we were the first case in all of Jersey history to be given back-to-back -back sentences for that same transaction. And removal of criminal property is a subsection of the Money Laundering Act. But to your layman who's reading the term money laundering, first thing you think, or at least the first thing I would think is, he's been washing money through his businesses. And that's not what it means. But you've got no opportunity to give context to it. All you've got is ITV News saying, importation of cannabis, money laundering. So as far as the outside world's concerned with my, you know, at this point, I can't get out and talk. Okay, whilst he's been doing all this positive stuff on, on TV and everything else, he's secretly been selling cannabis in the background and he's been washing money through his business. And, and I'm, my hands are tied and my mouth's zipped closed and I can't say anything at this point. So my, my life starts, or aspects of my life at least start crumbling around me. And it, it's, you know, it become very apparent very quickly that there was a motivation there to make an example out of me. And my, the solicitor that I used is from a, a firm called Baker and Partners and they represented Curtis when he got his 20 years over there. I thought, I'm going to go with the most high profile lawyers. I'll pay the money because I'll, I'll you know, it, it will, it will pay off. And I spent the best part of a 60 grand on legal fees with this firm thinking they were going to get me this fantastic result. And it comes to sentencing and for the quantity that they'd, they'd arrested me for and indicted me for, the sentence that should have come out of that was about 14 months. And the prosecution had put this number forward and he'd said on a, on a purely mathematical basis, the sentencing for, for this charge should be however many months it was. And I did the math and I contacted my, my lawyer. I was like, that's wrong. He's added on like six months there. He said, he's, he's, and he's quite literally used the terms mathematically, you know, on a purely mathematical basis. I said, and then he's got his maths wrong. I said, he's a prosecutor of 20 years here. How is he getting this wrong? And he's like, oh, don't worry about that. We'll get that dealt with when we go to court. It's not a problem. When we get to court on sentencing day and the, the, ju the judge is reading, reading the charges and he reads this bit from the prosecution and even he goes, that doesn't look right. And he's called him out in court and he said, the math doesn't work there. He said, you've, you've given him more, more than you should have. And at this point I'm thinking, Okay, he sees the error. And then they talk about the consecutive sentencing and whatever else and how, and, you know, it, it should always be counted as concurrent. So I thought, I'm sat in the dock thinking, right, we've got a good shot at community service here. My sentence should be about 14 months. I'd already served six, seven months. They spoke to probation in Merseyside. They said they were happy to take on my community service. I was, if I was given community service. So I thought, look, everything's, everything's looking fantastic here. And they recessed and they come back in you get your hats in, in jail, it doesn't work like, like it does in the UK. You don't just get one judge. You get a panel of what they call jurats, not jury jurats, which are basically a load of senior figures on the island that sit. So you have the, the you know, the, the equivalent of five judges sat there in their fancy wigs and it's really intimidating and they come back out and the, for the first sort of minute or so, they're talking about, you know, everything that I've done positive. And I thought, this is fantastic. And then you hear that. However, and then they get into, he's like, you know, you, you, uh, you're a man of 30 years of age. Um, you've done this before you are in our eyes, a professional drug dealer, a professional money launderer. And they dished this sentence out to me and completely ignored the fact that even the, the, the lead bailiff himself had pointed out the, the inaccuracy in the math. They went with it anyway. So they give me more, they give me six months extra for the cannabis than I should have ever got. And then they give me another year on top for receiving the money for the cannabis, which has never happened in the history of Jersey law. So I, I ended up with a three year sentence on what should have been a maximum 14 months. And then when I spoke to my, my, my lawyer afterwards, I was like, what the fuck just happened? He said, Nick, I've been in this game 30 years, bearing in mind this fellow is one of the, one of the most prestigious lawyers on the entire island. He said, I've never seen anything like it at all he said you you you've really pissed somebody off high up i said what do you mean by that he's like i can't say more than that he said but trust me you've you've irritated somebody who's in a position of you know of some influence he said look we can appeal it he said and i'm confident that we'll get them you know we'll get the year taken off for things to run concurrence and we'll get your sentence brought down i said how long is that going to take he said about six months i said six months I said, if I transfer to the UK now, I can be out in five months on tag, which is 
where I've got on my ankle now. I said, so what you're telling me is I could stay here for another six months, get a year and a half taken off my sentence and still end up doing more jail time than if I just accept what I've got now. And I think the prosecution were aware of that. I think they hit me with, with more than they, more than they knew I should have gotten knowing that the time it would take me to appeal it would keep me in jail longer. So no matter, no matter what way I approached it, they were they, fucked. I was fucked. Yeah, completely. It's mad that, but, but when you go up against the system, especially the, the the headlines that you made, look what happens. Like even though like you can have a tinfoil hat on, but there's got to be some sort of connection there. That like, you made that much noise, you created change, but when you go against the grain and try and, and get that noise, if you become so popular and and people start believing what you say, and then you start growing a following. They just shut you down, man. They just shut you up. Listen, is that what you want to do? There you go. There's free. There's another free stretch. Like, if you come back out again, listen, there'll be another six waiting for you. Like, it's fucking scary. Like the cancel culture now, and when you start making noise, and because everybody sees the world differently, but if you're not going what is an agenda, then you're fucked. Yeah. If you're not conforming, you're a target, and it and it's it, it's unfortunate, it's, and and that's the result of me put my head above the, you know, the, 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 the parapet and it, it's, and as I was saying before we, you know, before we started this talk today, was it worth me doing? Definitely. If I could go back now and not to, not have taken that stance in COVID and potentially saved myself this prison sentence, would I go back and change it? No, I wouldn't. We impacted millions of people's lives positively. You know, we, we made a, a, a historic significant impact on the physical and mental health of the country. You know, we, we, we set precedent for people to then start asking questions and for people to stand up for themselves. I, I wouldn't change it at all. And, you know, if, if, if that was the catalyst of me having this sentence, which it looks from the investigation that that's exactly what happened because of the three years of them doing nothing, so be it. If that's a sacrifice that I have to make for and I don't, I'm not trying to sound like a, a martyr here, you know, oh, oh I, I did this and that's what I got for it. I feel better in myself from having done that. Forget the praise and the press and anything else. I feel better for knowing that I took that position and stood up and gone through everything that followed because that was a gamble. Yeah, because sometimes you doubt yourself, but then it comes out that fucking Boris Johnson's having Christmas parties, they're all having yeah. tear, up, tear ups and everybody's yeah. in the house wearing masks, losing businesses, putting on weight, suicidal, yeah. like, and they're, they're all hypocrisy. fucking partying, do you know what I mean? Like, they they're must be laughing, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, what are you thinking then when you got a free? Because when you got that then, you lost your partner, your grand passed away who's always been there for you, like, how does that then fuck with everything that you've tried to like, The year that I spent in prison, especially the last six months that I spent in Liverpool, felt like 10 times longer than the three years I did previously like that. That 12 months that I've just done felt like 10 years in comparison to the three that I did previously like that. That's the hardest thing I've gone through emotionally in my entire life. And I got stitched up with the sentence. I got stitched up with everything that went along the way. And then I lost my nan. Um, and she's the closest thing that I had to a, you know, a, 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 a maternal mother, you know, the closest kind of physical connection I had to a mother was my nan. I lost my nan and then me and my partner split up around the, the same time. Um, but, you know, the, 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 everything that we lost business wise. And then coming home, you know, I was excited for it, but I was also quite apprehensive and, and I was very disappointed that I got done dirty by my local newspaper. Like that really bothered me. Interesting. So when the when when the press ran with it, the Jersey Evening Post, the chief the editor in chief come to court specifically out of respect for me to report on it accurately, not do me any favours, to report on it accurately. And they ran with the headline, Reformed Trafficker Jailed for Years Old Offence bang on the money. Am I a reformed trafficker? Yes, 100%. Was I back in jail for something that had happened years before? Yes. It goes on, it go, the article goes on to explain the situation, how old it was, how it was suspicious that the, you know, customs had left it for three years without acting on it. The fact that I had references from barristers and CEOs, doctors, you know, politicians. I had, I had probably the best mitigation the court had ever seen. And that was all covered accurately. And that was the Jersey Evening Post. The Liverpool Echo, however, run with, 
anti-lockdown gym boss exposed as professional drug dealer. Now, seeing that absolutely broke my heart. And they used this picture of me from 2014 where when I was abusing steroids and my face is like a beach ball and I've got this skinhead and I look like a look like a mean bastard. It's, a, it's not a flattering photo at all. They, so they run with that headline and that picture and absolutely slander me, give no context to the time, give no context to, you know, what I've done with my life since or anything, you know, completely misreport it, but to the point where they're not lying. I mean, they can use the term anti-lockdown gym boss. Like that's their opinion, despite the World Health Organization taking the same position as me as lockdown, but I'm, I'm the anti-lockdown gym boss on I couldn't, you know, as far as they want to wear it. But that, okay, that's their opinion. But exposed as professional drug dealer gives the impression that it's present time. And I've been exposed for doing this simultaneously to everything else I'm doing. And then the week later, they run with another article, uh, Merseyside gym owner's journey from prison to national fame and prison again. And then a third article another week later, slandering me again. And because they're owned by, I don't know if it's Mirror Group or Trinity Group, the rest jump on it then. So the Mirror, the Sun, the Star, all mimic the Liverpool Echo article. So I get, I, I've got all this slander now, and again, using the term money launderer and stuff like that. And that's the damage that does for me as a, as a, as a business and as a commercial entity to have my name plastered around everywhere as a money launderer with no context to what had actually happened. You know, that, that, that potentially blacklists me forever from, you know, a lot of avenues, but I've come out and the reception that I've had is more positive than I ever could have hoped for. You know, I, I, I I took my time to go back on social media. You know, I, I took a week or so to adjust myself, goes back on social media. And I have been inundated with thousands of messages. Everyone's super positive and everyone's got their tinfoil hats on. You know, you've been absolutely stitched up here. But, you know, all the backing that I had in terms of brands and politicians and friends, like the entire network, no one's pulled away from me at all because everybody knows how old it was. Everybody knows the journey that I've come on. So I, I've come back home now in arguably just as strong as a position is what I went away. So it, it, it's, it's trying to process that, you know, that time and that, that journey as, you know, just chalk that off to, you know, a, a, a lot of learning curve on it. Yeah. It's just old madness of the game that we're in. We just don't know what the fuck's going on. A necessary evil. Yeah. And it, it's the time I just spent in HMP Liverpool. There was hell. That's the hardest six months I've ever done in my life. That, that prison is, <laughs> Tough bastards in there. So all scouts yeah. are tough bastards, man. That like, yeah. never pull you well over their eyes like that. Just, the, the toughest of the tough, all yeah, in one place, and everyone's like trying a, to make a name out for themselves. It's like a planet within a planet. And like, they're just fucking mad bastards. Like, I love the scouts with the best, yeah. man. Like, but I just know how mad the fuckers are. And it's terrifying. And then wing, them wings in Liverpool, let's say five stories high, you've got your suicide nets, and there's always something going off. There's always someone getting caught up, and it, it's just chaos constantly and I, I I landed on the induction wing and I, I thought I was in a really good position and all, like uh, quite a few of the female staff knew me and followed me on social media so I was getting good treatment so I was there five or six days and then one of the male SOs I just started a shift and I'd become aware that I I was followed by these officers on social media seen as ass put a conflict of interest in against me moved me off the wing and put me on the worst wing in Liverpool which I think is uh, from what from what I'm told is the largest prison wing in all of Europe, G Wing of Liverpool. And it's huge. And it is intimidating as anything. And the six months I was on there was just a reminder of why I got out the game in the first place. Do you know what I mean? That is no place. Doesn't matter how hardened you are, that's not somewhere you want to be. And if any, uh, and I say this to people all the time, anyone that, that, that goes to prison and tells you that it ain't intimidating or it ain't scary, they're full of shit. It's a scary place and it's a lonely place. And even if you're not, even if you're not impacted too much by the environment and everything that goes on in there, just being pulled away from everything positive in your life is enough to, to destroy your soul. Where do you go then for the future, Nick? Like, you've had your roller coaster of a life. Like, you've had your sad moments, you've had your good moments, you've had world night, world press where you think life is amazing. Like, you've got fucking Jai D coming in to take your clothing brand, you lose it all, you're in the papers again, people who have backed you then puts 
elements of doubt in their mind that fuck me, like, I've backed somebody here that's pulled the wheel over their eyes to eventually getting your story out again, kind of try to get things back on track. Where do you go forward now from here? Forward from here, I promised myself I wouldn't go back into a thousand mile per hour lifestyle, but as I'm sure you're exactly the same, trying to stop yourself doing that is near impossible. So I've embraced the fact that I'm back in at full speed and, you know, I, I, my priority was having opportunities like this and getting opportunities from people like yourself to get the, the accurate story out first. That was what most was most important to me because, I, you know, I, I'm really proud of what I've done the last few years. Like, I'm really, really proud. And I, and I know that my nan and granddad were really proud of me and, I, you know, having that was more important to me than anything. And, you know, nothing can take away from that. So it was just important for me to set the record straight. And then once I've done that, and this is the, you know, one of the first big steps in doing that, I've got some press lined up from there. I'm going to take some time out, I think. At least that's what I'm telling myself. I'm in early talks at the minute with regards to having a book published. We'll see where that goes. I'm, I'm trying to slow myself down a little bit now because there's been that much that has happened through, through you know, straight from all our trauma as a kid, straight into this big international free running career to being all in the papers, to being in prison, to being out, to being all in the papers again, to being back in prison, to being all in the papers again. Here we are again. Like <laughs> it's been nonstop for 20 years. And I think I owe it to myself to force myself away from, you know, from all the hype, from all the madness, from all the work and just take a bit of time out. And I thought I'd just live again, just be, just be around people I care about again and just take that time. And it, it's difficult to do that and you get lost in the moment. And I know if I'm not hyper conscious of it, it's only going to be a matter of time before I get caught up in another moment. It's just going back to the basics again. Yeah. What's but, your social media platforms and that, Nick, for anybody that's maybe way to get in contact or just try to basically get in, they've spooked you for fucking with the lockdown shit, but for people, anybody that's maybe want to get involved or help you with businesses, help you with your book, like what's your social media platforms? My Instagram is nickcapo underscore underscore. My website is nickcapo.co.uk and that's pretty much it. I've come off Twitter, Facebook and a few of the others. So it's just uh, just Instagram and my website yeah, for fucking now. ruthless. I know we talk about mental health and that, but for anybody that's maybe watching that's struggling with mental health, what advice would you have for them? Talk. <laughs> talk. Simple with that. Yeah, talk, vocalise. Don't 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 suffer in silence. Don't isolate. You, you, there is always somebody that you can talk to, and oftentimes it's the people that you expect at least, the people that you think would be, people that you think would be there for you aren't always the ones that are. But you will find someone, and if you do find, if you do start talking, and you do find that confidence to talk about your issues, you will find the right person. And you know, as is evident from what we've talked about today regardless of what you've been through you will find a way through it if you can just find it in yourself to talk about it for any do you like to finish up on anything else brother no just a huge thank you for you for having me uh having me here today and this is this is the the first of uh of me being able to get my my voice back on record and find some clarity and find a bit of peace within myself so just yeah, gratitude to yourself man. Day, mate, being brave enough to talk about the pain of the past as well takes a lot of courage mate i wish you all the best for the future stay out of trouble and no doubt i'll see you soon my pleasure cheers, cheers brother